The Pursuit of God by A. W. Tozer Narrated by Mark Christensen And we shall know and follow on in knowing the Lord. His going forth is prepared as the dawn. Hosea 6, verse 3 Introduction Here is a masterly study of the inner life by a heart thirsting after God eager to grasp at least the outskirts of his ways, the abyss of his love for sinners, and the height of his unapproachable majesty. And it was written by a busy pastor in Chicago. Who could imagine David writing the 23rd Psalm on South Halstead Street, or a medieval mystic finding inspiration in a small study on the second floor of a frame house on that vast, flat checkerboard of endless streets. Where cross the crowded ways of life, where sound the cries of race and clan, in haunts of wretchedness and need, on shadowed thresholds, dark with fears and paths, where hide the lures of greed. But even as Dr. Frank Mason North of New York says in his immortal poem, so Mr. Tozer says in this book, Above the noise of selfish strife we hear thy voice, O son of man. My acquaintance with the author is limited to brief visits and loving fellowship in his church. There I discovered a self-made scholar, an omnivorous reader with a remarkable library of theological and devotional books, and one who seemed to burn the midnight oil in pursuit of God. His book is the result of long meditation and much prayer. It is not a collection of sermons. It does not deal with the pulpit and the pew, but with the soul, thirsty for God. The chapters could be summarized in Moses' prayer, Show me thy glory, or Paul's exclamation, O the depth of the riches both of the wisdom and of the knowledge of God, it is theology not of the head, but of the heart. There is deep insight, sobriety of style, and a universality of outlook that's refreshing. The author has few quotations, but he knows the saints and mystics of the centuries. St. Augustine, Nicholas of Cusa, Thomas Campus, Friedrich von Hügel, Charles Finney, John Wesley, and many more. The ten chapters are heart-searching, and the prayers at the close of each are for the closet, not the pulpit. I felt the nearness of God while reading them. Here is a book for every pastor, missionary, and devout Christian. It deals with the deep things of God and the riches of His grace. Above all, it has the keynote of sincerity and humility. Samuel M. Zwemer New York City Preface In this hour of all but universal darkness, one cheering gleam appears. Within the fold of conservative Christianity there are to be found increasing numbers of people whose religious lives are marked by a growing hunger after God Himself. They are eager for spiritual realities, and will not be put off with words. Nor will they be content with correct interpretations of the truth. They are thirsty for God, and they will not be satisfied until they have drunk deep at the fountain of living water. This is the only real harbinger of revival which I have been able to detect anywhere on the religious horizon. It may be the cloud the size of a man's hand for which a few saints here and there have been looking. It can result in a resurrection of life for many souls and a recapture of that radiant wonder which should accompany faith in Christ, that wonder which has all but fled the church in our day. But this hunger must be recognized by our religious leaders. Current evangelicalism has, to change the figure, laid the altar and divided the sacrifice into parts, but now seems satisfied to count the stones and rearrange the pieces with never a care 
that there is not a sign of fire upon the top of lofty Mount Carmel. But God be thanked that there are a few who care. They are those who, while they love the altar and delight in the sacrifice, are yet unable to reconcile themselves to the continued absence of fire. They desire God above all. They are thirsty to taste for themselves the piercing sweetness of the love of Christ, about whom all the holy prophets did write and the psalmists did sing. There is today no lack of Bible teachers to set forth correctly the principles of the doctrines of Christ. But too many of these seem satisfied to teach the fundamentals of the faith year after year, strangely unaware that there is in their ministry no manifest presence, nor anything unusual in their personal lives. They minister constantly to believers who feel within their breasts a longing which their teaching simply does not satisfy. I trust I speak in love, but the lack in our pulpits is real. Milton's terrible sentence applies to our day as accurately as it did to his. The hungry sheep look up and are not fed. It is a solemn thing, and no small scandal in the kingdom to see God's children starving while actually seated at the Father's table. The truth of Wesley's words is established before our eyes. Orthodoxy, or right opinion, is, at best, a very slender part of religion. Though right tempers cannot subsist without right opinions, yet right opinions may subsist without right tempers. There may be a right opinion of God without either love or one right temper toward him. Satan is proof of this. Thanks to our splendid Bible societies and to other effective agencies for the dissemination of the word, there are today many millions of people who hold right opinions, probably more than ever before in the history of the church. Yet, I wonder if there ever was a time when true spiritual worship was at a lower ebb. To great sections of the church, the art of worship has been lost entirely, and in its place has come that strange and foreign thing called the program. This word has been borrowed from the stage and applied with sad wisdom to the type of public service which now passes for worship among us. Sound Bible exposition is an imperative must in the church of the living God. Without it, no church can be a New Testament church in any strict meaning of that term. But exposition may be carried on in such a way as to leave the hearers devoid of any true spiritual nourishment whatsoever. For it is not mere words that nourish the soul, but God himself and unless and until the hearers find God in personal experience, they are not the better for having heard the truth. The Bible is not an end in itself, but a means to bring men to an intimate and satisfying knowledge of God, that they may enter into Him, that they may delight in His presence, may taste and know the inner sweetness of the very God Himself in the core and center of their being, their spirit. This book is a modest attempt to aid God's hungry children so to find Him. Nothing here is new, except in the sense that it's a discovery which my own heart has made of spiritual realities most delightful and wonderful to me. Others before me have gone much farther into these holy mysteries than I have done, but if my fire is not large, it is yet real, and there may be those who can light their candle at its flame. A. W. Tozer, Chicago, Illinois, June 16, 1948 Chapter 1 Following Hard After God My soul has followed hard after thee. Thy right hand has upheld me. Psalm 63, verse 8 Christian theology teaches the doctrine of prevenient grace, 
which briefly stated means this, that before a man can seek God, God must first have sought the man. Before a sinful man can think a right thought of God, there must have been a work of enlightenment done within him. It may be imperfect, but it is a true work nonetheless, and is the secret cause of all desiring and seeking, and praying which may follow. We pursue God because, and only because, He has first put an urge within us that spurs us to the pursuit. No one can come to me, said our Lord, unless the Father, who has sent me, draws him. And it is by this very prevenient drawing that God takes from us every vestige of credit for the act of coming. The impulse to pursue God originates with God, but the outworking of that impulse is our following hard after Him. And all the time we are pursuing Him, we are already in His hand. Thy right hand has upheld me. In this divine upholding and human following, there is no contradiction. All is of God, for as von Hugel teaches, God is always previous. In practice, however, that is, where God's previous working meets man's present response, man must pursue God. On our part, there must be positive reciprocation if this secret drawing of God is to eventuate an identifiable experience of the divine. In the warm language of personal feeling, this is stated in the 42nd Psalm. As the heart pants after the water brooks, so does my soul pant after thee, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? This is deep, calling unto deep and the longing heart will understand it. The doctrine of justification by faith, a biblical truth and a blessed relief from sterile legalism and unavailing self-effort, has in our time fallen into evil company and been interpreted by many in such manner as to actually bar men from the knowledge of God. The whole transaction of religious conversion has been made mechanical and spiritless. Faith may now be exercised without a jar to the moral life and without embarrassment to the Adamic ego. Christ may be received without creating any special love for him in the spirit of the receiver. The man is saved, but he is not hungry or thirsty after God. In fact, he is specifically taught to be satisfied and encouraged to be content with little. The modern scientist has lost God amid the wonders of his world. We Christians are in real danger of losing God amid the wonders of his word. We've almost forgotten that God is a spirit, and as such can be cultivated as any person can, for we are spirit. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Genesis 1 verse 27a It is inherent in personality to be able to know other personalities, but full knowledge of one personality by another can't be achieved in one encounter. It is only after long and loving mental interchange that the full possibilities of both can be explored. All social interchange between human beings is a response of personality to personality grading upward from the most casual brush between man and man to the fullest, most intimate communion of which the human spirit is capable. Religion, so far as it is genuine, is in essence the response of created personalities to the creating personality, God. And this is life eternal, that they might know Thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom Thou hast sent. In the deep of his mighty nature, God thinks, wills, enjoys, feels, loves, desires, and suffers as any other person may. In making himself known to us, he stays by the familiar pattern of personality. He communicates with us through the avenues of our minds, our wills, and our emotions. 
the continuous and unembarrassed interchange of love and thought between God and the spirit of the redeemed man is the throbbing heart of New Testament religion. This interchange between God and our spirit is known to us in conscious personal awareness. It is personal, that is, it does not come through the body of believers as such, but is known to the individual and to the body through the individuals which compose it. And it is conscious, that is, it does not stay below the threshold of consciousness and work there unknown to the soul, as, for instance, infant baptism is thought by some to do, but comes within the field of awareness where the man can know it as he knows any other fact of experience. You and I are in little degree, except for our sins, what God is in large degree. Being made in His image, we have within us the capacity to know Him. In our sins we lack only the power. The moment the Spirit has quickened us to life in regeneration, our whole being senses its kinship to God and leaps up in joyous recognition. That is the heavenly birth without which we cannot see the kingdom of God. It is, however, not an end, but an inception. For now begins the glorious pursuit, the heart's happy exploration of the infinite riches of the Godhead. That is where we begin, I say. But where we stop, no man has yet discovered. For there is neither limit nor end in the awful and mysterious depths of the triune God. Shoreless ocean, who can sound thee? Thine own eternity is round thee, majesty divine. To have found God and still to pursue him is a paradox of love, scorned indeed by the too easily satisfied religious person, but justified in happy experience by the children of the burning heart. St. Bernard of Clairvaux stated this holy paradox in a musical four-line poem that will be instantly understood by every worshipping soul. We taste thee, O thou living bread, and long to feast upon thee still. We drink of thee, the fountainhead, and thirst our souls from thee to fill. Come near to the holy men and women of the past, and you will soon feel the heat of their desire after God. They mourned for him. They prayed and wrestled and sought for him day and night, in season and out. And when they had found him, the finding was all the sweeter for the long seeking. Moses used the fact that he knew God as an argument for knowing him better. Now, therefore, I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way, that I may know thee, that I might find grace in thy sight. And from there he rose to make the daring request, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. God was frankly pleased by this display of ardor, and the next day called Moses into the mount, and there in solemn procession, made all his glory pass before him. David's life was a torrent of spiritual desire, and his psalms ring with the cry of the seeker and the glad shout of the finder. Paul confessed the mainspring of his life to be his burning desire after Christ. That I may know him was the goal of his heart, and to this he sacrificed everything. And doubtless, I even count all things as loss, for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. The hymns are sweet with a longing after God, the God whom, while the singer seeks, he knows he has already found. His track I see and I'll pursue, sang our fathers only a short generation ago. But that song is heard no more in the great congregation. How tragic that we in this dark day have had our seeking done for us by our teachers. 
Everything is made to center upon the initial act of accepting Christ, a term, incidentally, which is not found in the Bible. And we are not expected thereafter to crave any further revelation of God to our spirit. We have been snared in the coils of a false logic which insists that if we have found Him, we need no more seek Him. This is set before us as the last word in orthodoxy, and it is taken for granted that no Bible-taught Christian ever believed otherwise. Thus, the whole testimony of the worshipping, seeking, singing church on that subject is crisply set aside. The experiential heart theology of a grand army of fragrant saints is rejected in favor of a smug interpretation of Scripture, which would certainly have sounded strange to a St. Augustine, a Samuel Rutherford, or a David Brainerd. In the midst of this great chill there are some, I rejoice to acknowledge, who will not be content with shallow logic. They will admit the force of the argument and then turn away with tears to hunt some lonely place and pray, O oh God, show me thy glory. They want to taste, to touch with their hearts, to see with their inner eyes the wonder that is God. I want deliberately to encourage this mighty longing after God. The lack of it has brought us to our present low estate. The stiff and wooden quality about our religious lives is a result of our lack of holy desire. Complacency is a deadly foe of all spiritual growth. Acute desire must be present, or there will be no manifestation of Christ to His people. He waits to be wanted. Too bad that with many of us he waits so long, so very long, in vain. Every age has its own characteristics. Right now we are in the age of religious complexity. The simplicity which is in Christ is rarely found among us. In its stead are programs, methods, organizations, and a world of nervous activities which occupy time and attention, but can never satisfy the longing of the heart. The shallowness of our inner experience, the hollowness of our worship, and that servile imitation of the world, which marks our promotional methods, all testify that we, in this day, know God only imperfectly, and the peace of God scarcely at all. If we would find God amid all the religious externals, we must first determine to find Him, and then proceed in the way of simplicity. Now, as always, God reveals Himself to babes and hides Himself in thick darkness from the wise and the prudent. We must simplify our approach to Him. We must strip down to essentials, and they will be found to be blessedly few. We must put away all effort to impress and come with the guileless candor of childhood. If we do this, without doubt, God will quickly respond. When religion has said its last word, there is little that we need other than God Himself. The evil habit of seeking God and effectively prevents us from finding God in full revelation. In the end, lies our great woe. If we omit the end, we shall soon find God, and in Him we shall find that for which we have all our lives been secretly longing. We need not fear that in seeking God only we may narrow our lives or restrict the motions of our expanding hearts. The opposite is true. We can well afford to make God our all, to concentrate, to sacrifice the many for the one. The author of the quaint old English classic, The Cloud of Unknowing, teaches us how to do this. Lift up thine heart unto God with the meek stirring of love, and mean himself and none of his goods, and thereto look thee loath to think on aught but God himself, so that naught work in thy wit nor in thy will, but only God himself. 
This is the work of the soul that most pleaseth God. Again, he recommends that in prayer we practice a further stripping down of everything, even of our theology. For it sufficeth enough, a naked intent direct unto God without any other cause than himself. Yet underneath all his thinking lay the broad foundation of New Testament truth, for he explains that by himself he means God that made thee and bought thee and graciously called thee to thy degree. And he is all for simplicity. If we would have religion lapped and folded in one word, for that thou shouldst have better hold thereupon, take thee but a little word of one syllable, for so it is better than of two. For even the shorter, it is the better, it according with the work of the Spirit. And such a word is this word God, or this word love. When the Lord divided Canaan among the tribes of Israel, Levi received no share of the land. God said to him simply, I am thy part, and thine inheritance, and by those words made him richer than all his brethren, richer than all the kings and princes who have ever lived in the world. And there is a spiritual principle here, a principle still valid for every priest of the Most High God. The man who has God for his treasure has all things in one. Many ordinary treasures may be denied him, or if he is allowed to have them, the enjoyment of them will be so tempered that they will never be necessary to his happiness. Or if he must see them go, one after one, he will scarcely feel a sense of loss. For having the source of all things, he has in one all satisfaction, all pleasure, all delight. Whatever he may lose, he has actually lost nothing, for he now has it all in one, and he has it purely, legitimately, and forever. O oh God, I have tasted thy goodness, and it has both satisfied me and made me thirsty for more. I am painfully conscious of my need of further grace. I am ashamed of my lack of desire. O God, the triune God, I want Thee. I long to be filled with longing. I thirst to be more thirsty still. Show me Thy glory, I pray Thee, that so I may know Thee indeed. Begin in mercy a new work of love within me. Say to my soul, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. Then give me grace to rise and follow thee up from this misty lowland where I have wandered so long. In Jesus' name, Amen. Chapter 2 The Blessedness of Possessing Nothing Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of the heavens. Matthew 5, verse 3 before the Lord God made man upon the earth, he first prepared for him by creating a world of useful and pleasant things for his sustenance and delight. In the Genesis account of the creation, these are called simply things. They were made for man's uses, but they were meant always to be external to the man and subservient to him. In the deep heart of the man was a shrine where none but God was worthy to come. Within him was God, without a thousand gifts which God had showered upon him. But sin has introduced complications and has made those very gifts of God a potential source of ruin to the soul. Our woes began when God was forced out of his central shrine and things were allowed to enter. Within the human heart, things have taken over. Men have now, by nature, no peace within their hearts, for God is crowned there no longer. But there, in the moral dusk, stubborn and aggressive usurpers fight among themselves for first place on the throne. This is not a mere metaphor, but an accurate analysis of our real spiritual trouble. 
There is within the human heart a tough, fibrous root of fallen life whose nature is to possess, always to possess. It covets things with a deep and fierce passion. The pronouns my and mine look innocent enough in print, but their constant and universal use is significant. They express the real nature of the old Adamic man better than a thousand volumes of theology could do. They are verbal symptoms of our deep disease. The roots of our hearts have grown down into things, and we dare not pull up one rootlet lest we die. Things have become necessary to us, a development never originally intended. God's gifts now take the place of God, and the whole course of nature is upset by the monstrous substitution. Our Lord referred to this tyranny of things when he said to his disciples, If anyone will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever desires to save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Breaking this truth into fragments for our better understanding, it would seem that there is within each of us an enemy which we tolerate at our peril. Jesus called it life and self, or as we would say, the self-life. Its chief characteristic is its possessiveness. The words gain and profit suggest this. To allow this enemy to live is in the end to lose everything. To repudiate it and to give up all for Christ's sake is to lose nothing at last, but to preserve everything unto life eternal. And possibly also a hint is given here as to the only effective way to destroy this foe. It is by the cross. Let him Take up his cross and follow me. The way to deeper knowledge of God is through the lonely valleys of soul poverty and giving up of all things. The blessed ones who possess the kingdom are they who have repudiated every external thing and have rooted from their lives all sense of possessing. These are the poor in spirit. They have reached an inward state paralleling the outward circumstances of the common beggar in the streets of Jerusalem. That is what the word poor, as Christ used it, actually means. These blessed poor are no longer slaves to the tyranny of things. They have broken the yoke of the oppressor, and this they have done not by fighting but by surrendering. Though free from all sense of possessing, they yet possess all things. Theirs is the kingdom of the heavens. Let me exhort you to take this seriously. It is not to be understood as mere Bible teaching to be stored away in the mind along with the inert mass of other doctrines. It is a marker on the road to greener pastures, a path chiseled against the steep sides of the mount of God. We dare not try to bypass it if we would follow on in this holy pursuit. We must ascend a step at a time. If we refuse one step, we bring our progress to an end. As is frequently true, this New Testament principle of spiritual life finds its best illustration in the Old Testament. In the story of Abraham and Isaac, we have a dramatic picture of the surrendered life as well as an excellent commentary on the first beatitude. Abraham was old when Isaac was born, old enough indeed to have been his grandfather, and the child became at once the delight and idol of his heart. From that moment when he first stooped to take the tiny form awkwardly in his arms, he was an eager love slave of his son. Publisher's Note We are unaware of this thought being supported anywhere in Scripture. Rather, Genesis 22 verse 1 says, And it came to pass after these things that God proved Abraham. This verse indicates a test rather than a reprimand. Back to the text. God went out of his way to comment on the strength of this affection. And it's not hard to understand. The baby represented everything sacred to his father's heart. 
the promises of God, the covenants, the hopes of the years, and the long messianic dream. As he watched him grow from babyhood to young manhood, the heart of the old man was knit closer and closer with the life of his son, until at last the relationship bordered upon the perilous. It was then that God stepped in to save both father and son from the consequences of an uncleansed love. Take now thy son, said God to Abraham, thine only son Isaac, whom thou dost love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. The sacred writer spares us a close-up of the agony that night on the slopes near Beersheba, when the aged man had it out with his God. But respectful imagination may view in awe the bent form and convulsive wrestling alone under the stars. Possibly not again until a greater than Abraham wrestled in the Garden of Gethsemane did such mortal pain visit a human soul. If only the man himself might have been allowed to die, that would have been easier a thousand times, for he was old now, and to die would have been no great ordeal for one who had walked so long with God. Besides, it would have been a last sweet pleasure to let his dimming vision rest upon the figure of his stalwart son, who had lived to carry on the Abrahamic line and fulfill in himself the promises of God made long before in Ur of the Chaldees. How could he slay the lad? Even if he could get the consent of his wounded and protesting heart, how could he reconcile the act with the promise, In Isaac shall thy seed be called? This was Abraham's trial by fire, and he did not fail in the crucible. While stars still shone like sharp white points above the tent where the sleeping Isaac lay, and long before the gray dawn had begun to lighten the east, the old saint had made up his mind. He would offer his son as God had directed him to do, and then trust God to raise him from the dead. This, says the writer to the Hebrews, was the solution his aching heart found sometime in the dark night, and he rose early in the morning to carry out the plan. It is beautiful to see that, while he erred as to God's method, he had correctly sensed the secret of his great heart. And the solution accords well with the New Testament scripture, Whosoever will lose, for my sake shall find. God let the suffering old man go through with it up to the point where he knew there would be no retreat, and then forbade him to lay a hand upon the boy. To the wandering patriarch he now says, in effect, It's all right, Abraham. I never intended that you should actually slay the lad. I only wanted to remove him from the temple of your heart, that I might reign unchallenged there. I wanted to correct the perversion that existed in your love. Now you may have the boy, sound and well. Take him, and go back to your tent. Now I know that thou fearest God, seeing that thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. Then heaven opened, and a voice was heard saying to him, By myself I have sworn, said the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gates of his enemies, and in thy seed shall all the Gentiles of the earth be blessed, because thou hast hearkened unto my voice. The old man of God lifted his head to respond to the voice, and stood there on the mount, strong and pure and grand, a man marked out by the Lord for special treatment, a friend and favorite of the Most High. Now he was a man wholly surrendered, a man utterly obedient, a man who possessed nothing. He had concentrated his all in the person of his dear son, 
and God had taken it from him. God could have begun out on the margin of Abraham's life and worked inward to the center. He chose rather to cut quickly to the heart and have it over in one sharp act of separation. In dealing thus, he practiced an economy of means and time. It hurt cruelly, but it was effective. I have said that Abraham possessed nothing. Yet was not this poor man rich? Everything he had owned before was his still to enjoy. Sheep, camels, herds, and goods of every sort. He had also his wife and his friends. And, best of all, he had his son Isaac safe by his side. He had everything, but he possessed nothing. There is the spiritual secret. There is the sweet theology of the heart, which can be learned only in the school of renunciation. The books on systematic theology overlook this, but the wise will understand. After that bitter and blessed experience, I think the words my and mine never again had the same meaning for Abraham. The sense of possession which they connote was gone from his heart. Things had been cast out forever. They had now become external to the man. His inner heart was free from them. The world said, Abraham is rich. But the aged patriarch only smiled. He could not explain it to them, but he knew that he owned nothing, that his real treasures were inward and eternal. There can be no doubt that this possessive clinging to things is one of the most harmful habits in the life. Because it is so natural, it is rarely recognized for the evil that it is, but its outworkings are tragic. We are often hindered from giving up our treasures to the Lord out of fear for their safety. This is especially true when those treasures are loved relatives and friends. But we need have no such fears. Our Lord came not to destroy, but to save. Everything is safe which we commit to Him, and nothing is really safe which is not so committed. Our gifts and talents should also be turned over to Him. They should be recognized for what they are, God's loan to us, and should never be considered in any sense our own. We have no more right to claim credit for special abilities than for blue eyes or strong muscles. For who makes thee to judge? And what dost thou that thou didst not receive? The Christian who is alive enough to know himself even slightly will recognize the symptoms of this possession malady and will grieve to find them in his own heart. If the longing after God is strong enough within him, he will want to do something about the matter. Now, what should he do? First of all, he should put away all defense and make no attempt to excuse himself either in his own eyes or before the Lord. Whoever defends himself will have himself for his defense, and he will have no other. But let him come defenseless before the Lord, and he will have for his defender no less than God himself. Let the inquiring Christian trample underfoot every slippery trick of his deceitful heart and insist upon frank and open relations with the Lord. Then he should remember that this is holy business. No careless or casual dealings will suffice. Let him come to God in full determination to be heard. Let him insist that God accept his all that he take things out of his heart and himself reign there in power. It may be he will need to become specific, to name things and people by their names, one by one. If he will ever become drastic enough, he can shorten the time of his toil from years to minutes and enter the good land long before his slower brethren who coddle their feelings and insist upon caution in their dealings with God. Let us never forget that such a truth as this cannot be learned by rote, as one would learn the facts of physical science. They must be experienced before we can truly know them. We must, in our hearts, live through Abraham's harsh and bitter experiences, 
if we would know the blessedness which follows them. The ancient curse will not go out painlessly. The tough old miser within us will not lie down and die obedient to our command. He must be torn out of our heart like a plant from the soil. He must be extracted in agony and blood like a tooth from the jaw. He must be expelled from our soul by violence, as Christ expelled the money changers from the temple. And we shall need to steel ourselves against his piteous begging, and to recognize it as springing out of self-pity, one of the most reprehensible sins of the human heart. If we would indeed know God in growing intimacy, we must go this way of renunciation, and if we are set upon the pursuit of God, he will sooner or later bring us to this test. Abraham's testing was at that time not known to him as such. Yet, if he had taken some course other than the one he did, the whole history of the Old Testament would have been different. God would have found his man, no doubt, but the loss to Abraham would have been tragic beyond the telling. So we will be brought one by one to the testing place, and we may never know when we are there. At that testing place there will be no dozen possible choices for us. There will be just one, and an alternative. But our whole future will be conditioned by the choice we make. Father, I want to know thee, but my coward heart fears to give up its toys. I cannot part with them without inward bleeding. And I do not try to hide from thee the terror of the parting. I come trembling, but I do come. Please, root from my heart all those things which I have cherished so long and which have become a very part of my living self, so that thou mayest enter and dwell there without a rival. Then thou shalt make the place of thy feet glorious. Then shall my heart have no need of the sun to shine in it, for thyself will be the light of it, and there shall be no night there. In Jesus' name, amen. Chapter 3 Removing the Veil Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus. Hebrews 10, verse 19 among the famous sayings of the Church Fathers, none is better known than Augustine's, Thou hast formed us for thyself, and our hearts are restless till they find rest in thee. The saint states here in few words the origin and interior history of the human race. God made us for himself. That is the only explanation that satisfies the heart of a thinking man. Whatever his wild reason may say, should faulty education and perverse reasoning lead a man to conclude otherwise, there is little that any Christian can do for him. For such a man I have no message. My appeal is addressed to those who have been previously taught in secret by the wisdom of God. I speak to thirsty hearts whose longings have been awakened by the touch of God within them, and such as they need no reasoned proof. Their restless hearts furnish all the proof they need. God formed us for himself. The shorter catechism, agreed upon by the reverend assembly of divines at Westminster, as the old New England primer has it, asks the ancient questions what and why, and answers them in one short sentence hardly matched in any uninspired work. Question. What is the chief end of man? Answer. Man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. With this agree the four and twenty elders who fall on their faces to worship Him that liveth forever and ever, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and virtue, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy will they have their being and were created. God formed us for his pleasure, 
and so formed us that we, as well as he, can in divine communion enjoy the sweet and mysterious mingling of kindred personalities. He meant us to see him and live with him and draw our life from his smile. But we have been guilty of that foul revolt of which Milton speaks when describing the rebellion of Satan and his hosts. We have broken with God. We have ceased to obey him or love him, and in guilt and fear have fled as far as possible from his presence. Yet who can flee from his presence when the heaven and the heavens of heavens cannot contain him? when the wisdom of Solomon testifies that the Spirit of the Lord fills the world. The omnipresence of the Lord is one thing, and is a solemn fact necessary to his perfection. His manifest presence is another thing altogether, and from that presence we have fled, like Adam, to hide among the trees of the garden, or like Peter, to shrink away, crying, Depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. So the life of man upon the earth is a life away from his presence, wrenched loose from that blissful center which is our right and proper dwelling place, our first estate which we kept not, the loss of which is the cause of our unceasing restlessness. The whole work of God in redemption is to undo the tragic effects of that foul revolt and to bring us back again into right and eternal relationship with himself. This required that our sins be disposed of satisfactorily, that a full reconciliation be effected and the way opened for us to return again into conscious communion with God and to live again in his presence as before. Then by his prevenient working within us, he moves us to return. This first comes to our notice when our restless hearts feel a yearning for the presence of God, and we say within ourselves, I will arise and go to my Father. That is the first step. And as the Chinese sage Lao Tse has said, the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. The interior journey of the soul from the wilds of sin into the enjoyed presence of God is beautifully illustrated in the Old Testament tabernacle. The returning sinner first entered the outer court, where he offered a blood sacrifice on the brazen altar and washed himself in the laver that stood near it. Then, through a veil, he passed into the holy place where no natural light could come but the golden candlestick, which spoke of Jesus, the light of the world, threw its soft glow over all. There also was the showbread to tell of Jesus, the bread of life, and the altar of incense, a figure of unceasing prayer. Though the worshipper had enjoyed so much, still he had not yet entered the presence of God. Another veil separated from the Holy of Holies, where above the mercy seat dwelt the very God himself, in reverential and glorious manifestation. While the tabernacle stood, only the high priest could enter there, and that but once a year, with blood which he offered for his sins and the sins of the people. It was this last veil which was rent when our Lord gave up the ghost on Calvary and the sacred writer explains that this rending of the veil opened the way for every worshipper in the world to come by the new and living way straight into the divine presence. Everything in the New Testament accords with this Old Testament picture. Ransomed men need no longer pause in fear to enter the Holy of Holies. God wills that we should push on into His presence and live our whole life there. This is to be known to us in conscious experience. It is more than a doctrine to be held. It is a life to be enjoyed every moment of every day. This flame of his presence was the beating heart of the Levitical order. Without it, all the appointments of the tabernacle were characters of some unknown language. They had no meaning for Israel or for us. 
The greatest fact of the tabernacle was that Jehovah was there. A presence was waiting within the veil. Similarly, the presence of God is the central fact of Christianity. At the heart of the Christian message is God himself waiting for his redeemed children to push in to conscious awareness of his presence. That type of Christianity, which happens now to be the vogue, knows this presence only in theory. It fails to stress the Christian's privilege of present realization. According to its teachings, we are in the presence of God positionally, and nothing is said about the need to experience that presence actually. The fiery urge that drove men like Robert Murray McShane is wholly missing and the present generation of Christians measures itself by this imperfect rule. Lowly contentment takes the place of burning zeal. We are satisfied to rest in our judicial possessions, and for the most part, we bother ourselves very little about the absence of personal experience. Who is this within the veil who dwells in fiery manifestations it is none other than God Himself, one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of His Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made being of one substance with the Father, and the Holy Ghost, the Lord and Giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified. Yet this Holy Trinity is one God, for we worship one God in Trinity, and Trinity in unity, neither confounding the persons nor dividing the substance. For there is one person of the Father, another of the Son, and another of the Holy Ghost. But the Godhead of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost is all one, the glory equal and the majesty co-eternal. So in part run the ancient creeds, and so the inspired word declares. Behind the veil is God that God after whom the world, with strange inconsistency, has felt, if haply they might find him. He has revealed himself to some extent in nature, but more perfectly in the Incarnation. Now he waits to show himself in ravishing fullness to the humble of soul and pure in heart. The world is perishing for lack of the knowledge of God, and the church is famishing for want of his presence. The instant cure of most of our religious ills would be to enter his presence in spiritual experience, to become suddenly aware that we are in God, and that God is in us. This would lift us out of our pitiful narrowness and cause our hearts to be enlarged. This would burn away the impurities from our lives, as the bugs and fungi were burned away by the fire that dwelt in the bush. What a broad world to roam in! What a sea to swim in is this God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is eternal, which means that he predates time and is wholly independent of it. Time began in him and will end in him. To it he pays no tribute, and from it, he suffers no change. He is immutable, which means that he has never changed and can never change in any smallest measure. To change, he would need to go from better to worse, or from worse to better. He cannot do either, for being perfect, he cannot become more perfect. And if he were to become less perfect, he would be less than God. He is omniscient which means he knows in one free and effortless act all matter, all spirit, all relationships, all events. He has no past, and he has no future. 
He is, and none of the limiting and qualifying terms used of creatures can apply to him. Love and mercy and righteousness are his, and holiness so ineffable that no comparisons or figures will avail to express it. Only fire can give even a remote conception of it. In fire he appeared at the burning bush. In the pillar of fire he dwelt through all the long wilderness journey. The fire that glowed between the wings of the cherubim in the most holy place was called the Shekinah, the presence through the years of Israel's glory. And when the old had given place to the new, he came at Pentecost as a fiery flame and rested upon each disciple. Beric Spinoza wrote of the intellectual love of God, and he had a measure of truth there. But the highest love of God is not intellectual, it is spiritual. God is spirit, and only the spirit of man can know him really. In the deep spirit of a man the fire must glow, or his love is not the true love of God. The great ones of the kingdom have been those who loved God more than others did. We all know who they have been, and gladly pay tribute to the depths and sincerity of their devotion. We have but to pause for a moment, and their names come trooping past us, smelling of myrrh and aloes and cassia out of the ivory palaces. Frederick Faber was one whose soul panted after God as the roe pants after the water brook, and the measure in which God revealed himself to his seeking heart set the good man's whole life afire, with a burning adoration rivaling that of the seraphim before the throne. His love for God extended to the three persons of the Godhead equally, yet he seemed to feel for each one a special kind of love reserved for him alone. Of God the Father, he sings, only to sit and think of God. Oh, what a joy it is! To think the thought, to breathe the name, earth has no higher bliss. Father of Jesus, love's reward, what rapture will it be, prostrate before thy throne to lie, and gaze, and gaze on thee? His love for the person of Christ was so intense that it threatened to consume him. It burned within him as a sweet and holy madness, and flowed from his lips like molten gold. In one of his sermons he says, Wherever we turn in the church of God, there is Jesus. He is the beginning, middle, and end of everything to us. There is nothing good, nothing holy, nothing beautiful, nothing joyous which he is not to his servants. No one need be poor, because if he chooses, he can have Jesus for his own property and possession. No one need be downcast, for Jesus is the joy of heaven and it is his joy to enter into sorrowful hearts. We can exaggerate about many things, but we can never exaggerate our obligation to Jesus or the compassionate abundance of the love of Jesus to us. All our lives long we might talk of Jesus, and yet we should never come to an end of the sweet things that might be said of him. Eternity will not be long enough to learn all he is or to worship him for all he has done. But then that matters not, for we shall be always with him, and we desire nothing more. And addressing our Lord directly, he says to him, I love thee so. I know not how my transports to control. Thy love is like a burning fire within my very soul. Faber's blazing love extended also to the Holy Spirit. Not only in his theology did he acknowledge his deity and full equality with the Father and the Son, but he also celebrated it constantly in his songs and in his prayers. 
he literally pressed his forehead to the ground in his eager, fervid worship of the third person of the Godhead. In one of his great hymns to the Holy Spirit, he sums up his burning devotion thus, O Spirit, beautiful and dread, my heart is fit to break with love of all thy tenderness for us poor sinners' sake. I have risked the tedium of quotation that I might show by pointed example what I have set out to say, namely, that God is so vastly wonderful, so utterly and completely delightful that he can, without anything other than himself, meet and overflow the deepest demands of our total nature, mysterious and deep as that nature is. Such worship as Faber knew, and he is but one of a great company which no man can number, can never come from a mere doctrinal knowledge of God. Hearts that are fit to break with love for the Godhead are those who have been in his presence and have looked with open eye upon the majesty of the deity. Men of the breaking hearts had a quality about them not known to or understood by common men. They habitually spoke with spiritual authority. They had been in the presence of God, and they reported what they saw there. They were prophets, not scribes, for the scribe tells us what he has read, and the prophet tells us what he has seen. The distinction is not an imaginary one. Between the scribe who has read and the prophet who has seen, there is a difference as wide as the sea. We are today overrun with orthodox scribes, but the prophets, where are they? The hard voice of the scribe sounds over evangelicalism, but the church waits for the tender voice of the saint who has penetrated the veil and has gazed with inward eye upon the wonder that is God. And yet, Thus to penetrate, to push in sensitive living experience into the Holy Presence, is a privilege open to every child of God. With the veil removed by the rending of Jesus' flesh, with nothing on God's side to prevent us from entering, why do we tarry without? Why do we consent to abide all our days just outside the Holy of Holies and never enter at all to look upon God? We hear the bridegroom say, Let me see thy countenance. Let me hear thy voice. For sweet is thy voice, and thy countenance is beautiful. We sense that the call is for us but still we fail to draw near, and the years pass, and we grow old and tired in the outer courts of the tabernacle. What hinders us? The answer usually given, simply that we are cold, will not explain all the facts. There is something more serious than coldness of heart, something that may be behind that coldness and be the cause of its existence. What is it? What could it be but the presence of a veil in our hearts? It is a veil not taken away as the first veil was, but which remains there still shutting out the light and hiding the face of God from us. It is the veil of our fleshly fallen nature that lives on, unjudged within us, uncrucified, unrepudiated. It is the close-woven veil of the self-life which we have never truly acknowledged, of which we have been secretly ashamed, and which, for those reasons, we have never brought to the judgment of the cross. It is not too mysterious, this opaque veil, nor is it hard to identify. We have but to look in our own hearts, and we shall see it there sown and patched and repaired it may be, but there nevertheless, and an effective block to our spiritual progress. 
This veil is not a beautiful thing, and it is not a thing about which we commonly care to talk. But I am addressing the thirsting souls who are determined to follow God, and I know they will not turn back even though the way leads temporarily through the blackened hills. The urge of God within them will assure their continuing the pursuit. They will face the facts, however unpleasant, and endure the cross for the joy set before them. So I am bold to name the threads out of which this inner veil is woven. It is woven of the fine threads of the self-life, the hyphenated sins of the human spirit. They are not something we do, they are something we are, and therein lies both their subtlety and their power. To be specific, the self-sins are these, self-righteousness, self-pity, self-confidence, self-sufficiency, self-admiration, self-love, and a host of others like them. They dwell too deep within us and are too much a part of our natures to come to our attention until the light of God is focused upon them. The grosser manifestations of these sins, egotism, exhibitionism, self-promotion, are strangely tolerated in Christian leaders, even in circles of impeccable orthodoxy. They are so much in evidence as actually, for many people, to become identified with the gospel. I trust it is not a cynical observation to say that they appear these days to be a requisite for popularity in some sections of the church visible. Promoting self under the guise of promoting Christ is currently so common as to excite little notice. One should suppose that proper instruction in the doctrines of man's depravity and the necessity for justification through the righteousness of Christ alone would deliver us from the power of the self-sins, but it does not work out that way. Self can live unrebuked at the very altar. It can watch the bleeding victim die and not be in the least affected by what it sees. It can fight for the faith of the Reformers and preach eloquently the creed of salvation by grace and gain strength by its efforts. To tell all the truth, it seems actually to feed upon orthodoxy and is more at home in a Bible conference than in a tavern. Our very state of longing after God may afford it an excellent condition under which to thrive and grow. Self is the opaque veil that hides the face of God from us. It can be removed only in spiritual experience, never by mere instruction. We may as well try to instruct leprosy out of our system. There must be a work of God in destruction before we're free. We must invite the cross to do its deadly work within us. We must bring our sins to the cross for judgment. We must prepare ourselves for an ordeal of suffering, in some measure like that through which our Savior passed when he suffered under Pontius Pilate. Let us remember, when we talk of the rending of the veil, we're speaking figuratively, and the thought of it is poetical, almost pleasant. But in actuality, there is nothing pleasant about it. In human experience, that veil is made up of living spiritual tissue. It's composed of the conscious, quivering stuff of which our whole beings consist, and to touch it is to touch us where we feel pain. To tear it away is to injure us, to hurt us, and to make us bleed. To say otherwise is to make the cross no cross, and the death no death at all. It is never fun to die. To rip through the dear and tender stuff of which life is made can never be anything but deeply painful. Yet that is what the cross did to Jesus, and it's what the cross would do to every man to set him free. Let us beware of tinkering with our inner life in the hope of rending the veil ourselves. God must do everything for us. Our part is to yield and trust. We must confess the self-life. We must reckon it crucified. But we must be careful to distinguish lazy acceptance from the real work of God. We must insist upon the work being done. We dare not rest content with the neat doctrine of self-crucifixion. That is to imitate King Saul and spare the best of the sheep and the oxen. 
insist that the work be done in very truth, and it will be done. The cross is rough, and it is deadly, but it is effective. It does not keep its victim hanging there forever. There comes a moment when its work is finished and the suffering victim dies. After that is resurrection glory and power, and the pain is forgotten for the joy that the veil is taken away, and we have entered into actual spiritual experience with the presence of the living God. Lord, how excellent are thy ways! and how devious and dark are the ways of men. Show us how to die, that we may rise again to newness of life. Rend the veil of our self-life from the top down, as thou didst rend the veil of the temple. We would draw near in full assurance of faith. We would dwell with thee in daily experience here on this earth, so that we may be accustomed to the glory when we enter thy heaven, to dwell with thee there. In Jesus' name, amen. Chapter 4 Apprehending God O Taste and See Psalm 34, verse 8 It was Canon Holmes of India who more than twenty-five years ago called attention to the inferential character of the average man's faith in God. To most people, God is an inference, not a reality. He is a deduction from evidence which they consider adequate but he remains personally unknown to the individual. He must be, they say. Therefore, we believe he is. Others do not go even so far as this. They know of him only by hearsay. They have never bothered to think the matter out for themselves, but have heard about him from others and have put belief in him into the back of their minds along with the various odds and ends that make up their total creed. To many others, God is but an ideal, another name for goodness or beauty or truth, or he is law or life, or the creative impulse behind the phenomena of existence. These notions about God are many and varied, but those who hold them have one thing in common— they do not know God in personal experience. The possibility of intimate acquaintance with Him has not entered their minds. While admitting His existence, they do not think of Him as knowable in the sense that we know things or people. Christians, to be sure, go further than this, at least in theory. Their creed requires them to believe in the personality of God, and they have been taught to pray, Our Father who art in heaven. Now, personality and fatherhood carry with them the idea of the possibility of personal acquaintance. This is admitted, I say, in theory. But for millions of Christians, nevertheless, God is no more real than he is to the non-Christian. They go through life trying to love an ideal and be loyal to a mere principle. Over against all this cloudy vagueness stands the clear scriptural doctrine that God can be known in personal experience. A loving personality dominates the Bible, walking among the trees of the garden and breathing fragrance over every scene. Always a living person is present, speaking, pleading, loving, working, and manifesting himself whenever and wherever his people have the receptivity necessary to receive the manifestation. The Bible assumes as self-evident the fact that men can know God with at least the same degree of immediacy as they know any other person or thing that comes into the field of their experience. The same terms are used to express the knowledge of God as are used to express the knowledge of physical things. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. All thy garments smell of myrrh and aloes and cassia out of the ivory palaces. My sheep hear my voice. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Emphasis added. These are but four of countless such passages from the Word of God. And more important than any proof text is the fact that the whole import of the Scripture is toward this belief. What can all this mean? 
except that we have in our hearts organs by means of which we can know God as certainly as we know material things through our familiar five senses. We apprehend the physical world by exercising the faculties given us for the purpose, and we possess spiritual faculties by means of which we can know God and the spiritual world if we will obey the Spirit's urge and begin to use them. That a saving work must first be done in the heart is taken for granted here. The spiritual faculties of the unregenerate man lie asleep in his nature, unused, and for every purpose, dead. That is the stroke which has fallen upon us by sin. They may be quickened to active life again by the operation of the Holy Spirit in regeneration. That is one of the immeasurable benefits which come to us through Christ's atoning work on the cross. But, for the very ransomed children of God themselves, why do they know so little of that habitual conscious communion with God which the Scriptures seem to offer? The answer is our chronic unbelief. Faith enables our spiritual sense to function. Where faith is defective, the result will be inward insensibility and numbness toward spiritual things. This is the condition of vast numbers of Christians today. No proof is necessary to support that statement. We have but to converse with the first Christian we meet or enter the first church we find open to acquire all the proof we need. A spiritual kingdom lies all about us enclosing us, embracing us, altogether within reach of our inner selves, waiting for us to recognize it. God Himself is here waiting for our response to His presence. This eternal world will come alive to us the moment we begin to reckon upon its reality. I have just now used two words which demand definition. Or if definition is impossible, I must at least make clear what I mean when I use them. They are reality and reckon. What do I mean by reality? I mean that which has existence apart from any idea any mind may have of it, and which would exist if there were no mind anywhere to entertain a thought of it. That which is real has being in itself. It does not depend upon the observer for its validity. I am aware that there are those who love to poke fun at the plain man's idea of reality. They are the idealists who spin endless proofs that nothing is real outside of the mind. They are the relativists who like to show that there are no fixed points in the universe from which we can measure anything. They smile down upon us from their lofty intellectual peaks and settle us to their own satisfaction by fastening upon us the reproachful term absolutist. The Christian is not put out of countenance by this show of contempt. He can smile right back at them, for he knows that there is only one who is absolute, and that is God. But he knows also that the absolute one has made this world for man's uses, and while there is nothing fixed or real in the last meaning of the words, the meaning as applied to God, for every purpose of human life we are permitted to act as if there were. And every man does act thus, except the mentally ill. These unfortunates also have trouble with reality, but they are consistent. They insist upon living in accordance with their ideas of things. They are honest and it is their very honesty that constitutes a problem. The idealists and relativists are not mentally ill. They prove their soundness by living their lives according to the very notions of reality which they in theory repudiate, and by counting upon the very fixed points which they prove are not there. They could earn a lot more respect for their notions if they were willing to live by them but this they are careful not to do. Their ideas are brain-deep, not life-deep. Wherever life touches them, they repudiate their theories 
and live like other men. The Christian is too sincere to play with ideas for their own sake. He takes no pleasure in the mere spinning of gossamer webs for display. All his beliefs are practical. They are geared into his life. By them he lives or dies, stands or falls for this world and for all time to come. From the insincere man he turns away. The sincere, plain man knows that the world is real. He finds it here when he wakes to consciousness, and he knows that he did not think it into being. It was here waiting for him when he came, and he knows that when he prepares to leave this earthly scene, it will be here still to bid him goodbye as he departs. By the deep wisdom of life, he is wiser than a thousand men who doubt. He stands upon the earth, and feels the wind and rain in his face, and he knows that they are real. He sees the sun by day and the stars by night. He sees the hot lightning play out of the dark thundercloud. He hears the sounds of nature and the cries of human joy and pain. These he knows are real. He lies down on the cool ground at night, and has no fear that it will prove illusory or fail him while he sleeps. In the morning, the firm ground will be under him, the blue sky above him, and the rocks and trees around him as when he closed his eyes the night before. So he lives and rejoices in a world of reality. With his five senses he engages this real world, all things necessary to his physical existence, he apprehends by the faculties with which he has been equipped by the God who created him and placed him in such a world as this. Now, by our definition, God is also real. He is real in the absolute and final sense that nothing else is. All other reality is contingent upon his. The great reality is God who is the author of that lower and dependent reality which makes up the sum of created things, including ourselves. God has objective existence, independent of and apart from any notions which we may have concerning him. The worshipping heart does not create its object. It finds him here when it wakes from its moral slumber in the morning of its regeneration. Another word that must be cleared up is the word reckon. This does not mean to visualize or imagine. Imagination is not faith. The two are not only different from, but also stand in sharp opposition to each other. Imagination projects unreal images out of the mind and seeks to attach reality to them. Faith creates nothing. It simply reckons upon that which is already there. God and the spiritual world are real. We can reckon upon them with as much assurance as we reckon upon the familiar world around us. Spiritual things are there, or rather we should say here, inviting our attention and challenging our trust. Our trouble is that we've established bad thought habits, we habitually think of the visible world as real and doubt the reality of any other. We do not deny the existence of the spiritual world, but we doubt that it is real in the accepted meaning of the word. The world of sense intrudes upon our attention day and night for the whole of our lifetime. It is clamorous, insistent, and self-demonstrating. It does not appeal to our faith. It is here assaulting our five senses, demanding to be accepted as real and final. But sin has so clouded the lenses of our hearts that we cannot see that other reality, the city of God, shining around us. The world of sense triumphs. The visible becomes the enemy of the invisible and the temporal of the eternal. That is the curse inherited by every member of Adam's tragic race. At the root of the Christian life lies belief in the invisible. The object of the Christian's faith 
is unseen reality. Our uncorrected thinking, influenced by the blindness of our natural hearts and the intrusive ubiquity of visible things, tends to draw a contrast between the spiritual and the real. But actually, no such contrast exists. The antithesis lies elsewhere, between the real and the imaginary, between the spiritual and the material, between the temporal and the eternal. But between the spiritual and the real, never. The spiritual is real. If we would rise into that region of light and power, plainly beckoning us through the scriptures of truth, we must break the evil habit of ignoring the spiritual. We must shift our interest from the seen to the unseen. For the great unseen reality is God. He that comes to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of those that diligently seek Him. This is basic in the life of faith. From there we can rise to unlimited heights. Ye believe in God, said our Lord Jesus Christ. Believe also in me. Without the first, there can be no second. If we truly want to follow God, we must seek to be otherworldly. This I say knowing well that that word has been used with scorn by the sons of this world and applied to the Christians as a badge of reproach. So be it. Every man must choose his world. If we, who follow Christ, with all the facts before us and knowing what we are about, deliberately choose the kingdom of God as our sphere of interest, I see no reason why anyone should object. If we lose by it, the loss is our own. If we gain, we rob no one by so doing. The other world, which is the object of this world's disdain and the subject of the drunkard's mocking song, is our carefully chosen goal and the object of our holiest longing. But we must avoid the common fault of pushing the other world into the future. It is not future, but present. It parallels our familiar physical world, and the doors between the two worlds are open. But ye are come, says the writer to the Hebrews, and the tense is plainly present, unto Mount Sion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the congregation of the called-out ones of the firstborn, who are registered in the heavens, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the New Testament, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. All these things are contrasted with the mount that might be touched, and the sound of a trumpet, and the voice of words that might be heard. May we not safely conclude that as the realities of Mount Sinai were apprehended by the senses, so the realities of Mount Zion are to be grasped by the soul. And this is not by any trick of the imagination, but in downright actuality. The soul has eyes with which to see and ears with which to hear. Feeble they may be from long disuse, but by the life-giving touch of Christ alive now and capable of sharpest sight and most sensitive hearing. As we begin to focus upon God, the things of the Spirit will take shape before our inner eyes. Obedience to the Word of Christ will bring an inward revelation of the Godhead. John 14, verses 21 through 23. It will give acute perception, enabling us to see God, even as is promised to the pure in heart. A new God consciousness will seize upon us and we shall begin to taste and hear, and inwardly feel the God who is our life and our all. There will be seen the constant shining of the light that lights up every man that comes into the world, 
more and more as our faculties grow sharper and more sure, God will become to us the great all, and His presence the glory and wonder of our lives. O God, quicken to life every power within me, that I may lay hold on eternal things. Open my eyes that I may see. Give me acute spiritual perception. Enable me to taste thee and know that thou art good. Make heaven more real to me than any earthly thing has ever been. In Jesus' name, amen. Chapter 5 The Universal Presence Where shall I go from thy spirit? Or where shall I flee from thy presence? Psalm 139, verse 7 In all Christian teaching, certain basic truths are found, hidden at times, and rather assumed than asserted but necessary to all truth, as the primary colors are found in and necessary to the finished painting. Such a truth is the divine immanence. God dwells in His creation and is everywhere indivisibly present in all His works. This is boldly taught by prophet and apostle and is accepted by Christian theology generally. That is, it appears in the books, but for some reason it has not sunk into the average Christian's heart so as to become a part of his believing self. Christian teachers shy away from its full implications, and if they mention it at all, mute it down until it has little meaning. I would guess the reason for this is the fear of being charged with pantheism. But the doctrine of the divine presence is definitely not pantheism. Pantheism's error is too palpable to deceive anyone. It is that God is the sum of all created things. Nature and God are one, so that whoever touches a leaf or a stone touches God. That is, of course, to degrade the glory of the incorruptible deity and, in an effort to make all things divine, banish all divinity from the world entirely. The truth is that while God dwells in His world, He is separated from it by a gulf forever impassable. However closely he may be identified with the work of his hands, they are and must eternally be other than he, and he is and must be antecedent to and independent of them. He is transcendent above all his works even while he is imminent within them. What now does the divine imminence mean in direct Christian experience? It means simply that God is here. Wherever we are, God is here. There is no place, there can be no place where He is not. Ten million intelligences stand at as many points in space and separated by incomprehensible distances can each one say with equal truth, God is here. No point is nearer to God than any other point. It is exactly as near to God from any place as it is from any other place. No one is in mere distance any farther from or any nearer to God than any other person is. These are truths believed by every instructed Christian. It remains for us to think on them and pray over them until they begin to glow within us. In the beginning, God. Not in the beginning, matter, for matter is not self causing. It requires an antecedent cause and God is that cause. Not in the beginning law, for the law is but a name for the course which all creation follows. That course had to be planned, and the planner is God. Not in the beginning mind, for mind also is a created thing, and must have a creator behind it. But in the beginning God, the uncaused cause of matter, mind, and law. There we must begin. Adam sinned, and in his panic frantically tried to do the impossible. He tried to hide from the presence of God. 
David also must have had wild thoughts of trying to escape from God's presence, for he wrote, Where shall I go from thy spirit? Or where shall I flee from thy presence? Then he proceeded through one of his most beautiful psalms to celebrate the glory of the divine immanence. If I ascend to the heavens, thou art there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the dawn and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. And he knew that God's being and God's seeing are the same, that the seeing presence had been with him even before he was born, watching the mystery of unfolding life. Solomon exclaimed, But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, the heavens, the heavens of heavens cannot contain thee, how much less this house which I have built. Paul assured the Athenians that God is not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. If God is present at every point in space, if we cannot go where he is not, cannot even conceive of such a place where he is not, why then has not that presence become the one universally celebrated fact of the world? The patriarch Jacob, in the waste, howling wilderness, gave the answer to that question. He saw a vision of God and cried out in wonder, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. Jacob had never been for one small division of a moment outside the circle of that all-pervading presence but he knew it not. That was his trouble, and it is ours. Men do not know that God is here. What a difference it would make if they knew. The presence and the manifestation of the presence are not the same. There can be the one without the other. God is here when we are wholly unaware of it. He is manifest only when and as we are aware of his presence. On our part, there must be surrender to the Spirit of God, for his work is to show us the Father and the Son. If we cooperate with him in loving obedience, God will manifest himself to us, and that manifestation will be the difference between a nominal Christian life and a life radiant with the light of his face. Always, everywhere, God is present, and always he seeks to reveal himself. To each one he would reveal not only that he is, but what he is as well. He did not have to be persuaded to reveal himself to Moses, and the Lord descended in a cloud, and was with him there proclaiming the name of I Am. He not only made a verbal proclamation of his nature, but he also revealed his very self to Moses so that the skin of Moses' face shone with the supernatural light. It will be a great moment for some of us when we begin to believe that God's promise of self-revelation is literally true, that he promised much, but he promised no more than he intends to fulfill. Our pursuit of God is successful just because He is forever seeking to manifest Himself to us. The revelation of God to any man is not God coming from a distance upon a time to pay a brief and momentous visit to a man's soul. Thus to think of it is to misunderstand it all. The approach of God to the soul or of the soul to God is not to be thought of in spatial terms at all. There is no idea of physical distance involved in the concept. It is not a matter of miles, but of experience. To speak of being near to or far from God is to use language in a sense always understood when applied to our ordinary human relationships. A man may say, I feel that my son is coming nearer to me as he gets older. And yet that son has lived by his father's side since he was born and has never been away from home more than a day or so in his entire life. What then can the father mean? Obviously, he is speaking of experience. He means that the boy is coming to know him more intimately and with deeper understanding, 
that the barriers of thought and feeling between the two are disappearing, that father and son are becoming more closely united in mind and heart. So when we sing, Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, we are not thinking of the nearness of place, but of the nearness of relationship. It is for increasing degrees of awareness that we pray, for a more perfect consciousness of the divine presence. We need never shout across the spaces to an absent God. He is nearer than our own soul, closer than our most secret thoughts. Why do some people find God in a way that others do not? Why does God manifest His presence to some and let multitudes of others struggle along in the half-light of imperfect Christian experience? Of course, the will of God is the same for all. He has no favorites within His household. All He has ever done for any of His children, He will do for all of His children. The difference lies not with God, but with us. Pick at random a score of great saints whose lives and testimonies are widely known. Let them be Bible characters or well-known Christians of post-biblical times. You will be struck instantly with the fact that the saints are not alike. Sometimes the unlikenesses were so great as to be positively glaring. How different, for example, was Moses from Isaiah? How different was Elijah from David? How unlike each other were John and Paul, St. Francis and Luther, Finney and Thomas a Kempis. The differences are as wide as human life itself. Differences of race, nationality, education, temperament, habit, and personal qualities. Yet they all walked, each in his day, upon a high road of spiritual living far above the common way. I could say that the differences must have been incidental, and in the eyes of God of no significance. In some vital quality they must have been alike. What was it? I venture to suggest that the one vital quality which they had in common was spiritual receptivity. Something in them was open to heaven, something which urged them Godward. Without attempting anything like a profound analysis, I shall say simply that they had spiritual awareness and then they went on to cultivate it until it became the biggest thing in their lives. They differed from the average person in that when they felt the inward longing, they did something about it. They acquired the lifelong habit of spiritual response. They were not disobedient to the heavenly vision. As David put it neatly, My heart has spoken unto me from thee. Seek ye my face. Thy face, O Lord, will I seek. As with everything good in human life, behind this receptivity is God. The sovereignty of God is here and is even felt by those who have not placed particular stress upon it theologically. The pious Michelangelo confessed this in a sonnet. My unassisted heart is a barren clay that of its native self can nothing feed. Of good and pious works thou art the seed that quickens only where thou sayest it may. Unless thou show to us thine own true way, no man can find it. Father, thou must lead. These words will repay study as the deep and serious testimony of a great Christian. Important as it is that we recognize God working in us, I would yet warn against a too great preoccupation with the thought. It is a sure road to sterile passivity. God will not hold us responsible to understand the mysteries of election, predestination, and the divine sovereignty. The best and safest way to deal with these truths is to raise our eyes to God and in deepest reverence say, O oh Lord, Thou knowest. Those things belong to the deep and mysterious profoundness of God's omniscience. Prying into them may make theologians, but it will rarely make saints. Receptivity is not a single thing. Rather, it is a compound, a blending of several elements within the soul. It is an affinity for, 
a bent toward, a sympathetic response to, a desire to have. From this it may be gathered that it can be present in degrees, that we may have little or more, or less, depending on the individual. It may be increased by exercise or destroyed by neglect. It is not a sovereign and irresistible force which comes upon us as a seizure from above. It is a gift of God indeed, but one which must be recognized and cultivated as any other gift if it is to be realized for the purpose for which it was given. Failure to see this is the cause of a very serious breakdown in modern evangelicalism. The idea of cultivation and exercise, so dear to the saints of old, has now no place in our total religious picture. It is too slow, too common. We now demand glamour and fast-flowing dramatic action. A generation of Christians reared among push-buttons and automatic machines is impatient with slower and less direct methods of reaching their goals. We have been trying to apply machine-age methods to our relationships with God. We read our chapter, have a short devotion, and rush away, hoping to make up for our deep inward bankruptcy by attending another gospel meeting or listening to another thrilling story told by a religious adventurer lately returned from afar. The tragic results of this spirit are all about us. Shallow lives, hollow religious philosophies, the preponderance of the element of fun in gospel meetings, the glorification of man. Trust in religious externalities, quasi-religious fellowships, salesmanship methods, the mistaking of dynamic personality for the power of the Spirit. These and such as these are the symptoms of an evil disease, a deep and serious malady of the soul. For this great sickness that is upon us, no one person is responsible and no Christian is wholly free from blame. We have all contributed, directly or indirectly, to this sad state of affairs. We have been too blind to see, or too timid to speak out, or too self-satisfied to desire anything better than the poor, average diet with which others appear satisfied. To put it differently, we have accepted one another's notions, copied one another's lives, and made one another's experiences the model for our own. And for a generation the trend has been downward. Now we have reached a low place of sand and burnt wire grass. And worst of all, we have made the word of truth conform to our experience and accepted this low plain as the very pasture of the blessed. It will require a determined heart, and more than a little courage, to wrench ourselves loose from the grip of our times and return to biblical ways. But it can be done. Every now and then in the past, Christians have had to do it. History has recorded several large-scale returns led by such men as St. Francis, Martin Luther, and George Fox. Unfortunately, there seems to be no Luther or Fox on the horizon at present. Whether or not another such return may be expected before the coming of Christ is a question upon which Christians are not fully agreed, but that is not of too great importance to us just now. What God in His sovereignty may yet do on a worldwide scale I do not claim to know, but what He will do for the plain man or woman who seeks His face, I believe I do know and can tell others. Let any man return to God in earnest. Let him begin to exercise himself unto godliness. Let him seek to develop his powers of spiritual receptivity by trust and obedience and humility. And the results will exceed anything he may have hoped in his leaner and weaker days. Any man who by repentance and a sincere return to God will break himself out of the mold in which he has been held and will go to the Bible itself for his spiritual standards, he will be delighted with what he finds there. Let us say it again. The universal presence is a fact. God is here. 
The whole universe is alive with his life. And he is no strange or foreign God, but the familiar Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, whose love has for these thousands of years enfolded the sinful race of men. And always he is trying to get our attention, to reveal himself to us, to communicate with us. We have within us the ability to know him, if we will but respond to his overtures, and this we call pursuing God. We will know him in increasing degree as our receptivity becomes more perfect by faith and love and practice. O oh God and Father, I repent of my sinful preoccupation with visible things. The world has been too much with me. Thou hast been here, and I knew it not. I have been blind to thy presence. Open my eyes, that I may behold thee in and around me. In Jesus' name, amen. Chapter 6 The Speaking Voice In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John 1, verse 1 An intelligent, plain man, untaught in the truths of Christianity, coming upon this text would likely conclude that John meant to teach that it is the nature of God to speak, to communicate his thoughts to others. And he would be right. A word is a medium by which thoughts are expressed, and the application of the term to the eternal Son leads us to believe that self-expression is inherent in the Godhead, that God is forever seeking to speak Himself out to His creation. The whole Bible supports the idea. God is speaking. Not God spoke, but God is speaking. He is by His nature continuously articulate. He fills the world with His speaking voice. One of the great realities with which we have to deal is the voice of God in His world. The briefest and only satisfying cosmogony is this. For He spoke, and it was done. The why of natural law is the living voice of God, imminent in His creation. And this word of God, which brought all worlds into being, cannot be understood to mean the Bible, for it is not a written or printed word at all but the expression of the will of God, spoken into the structure of all things. This word of God is the breath of God, filling the world with living potentiality. The voice of God is the most powerful force in nature. Indeed, it is the only force in nature, for all energy is here only because the power-filled word is being spoken. The Bible is the written word of God, and because it is written, it is confined and limited by the necessities of ink and paper. The voice of God, however, is alive and free as the sovereign God is free. The words that I have spoken unto you, they are spirit, and they are life. The life is in the speaking words. God's word in the Bible can have power only because it corresponds to God's word in the universe. It is the present voice which makes the written word all-powerful. Otherwise, it would lie locked in slumber within the covers of a book. We take a low and primitive view of things when we conceive of God at the creation, coming into physical contact with things, shaping and fitting and building like a carpenter. The Bible teaches otherwise. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. For he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it came into being. And through faith we understand that the ages were framed by the word of God. Again, we must remember that God is referring here not to his written word, but to his speaking voice. His world-filling voice is meant, that voice which predates the Bible by uncounted centuries, that voice which has not been silent since the dawn of creation, 
but is sounding still throughout the far reaches of the universe. The Word of God is quick and powerful. In the beginning he spoke to nothing, and it became something. Chaos heard it and became order. Darkness heard it and became light. And God said, and it was so. These twin phrases, as cause and effect, occur throughout the Genesis story of the creation. The said accounts for the so. The so is the said put into the continuous present. That God is here and that he is speaking. These truths are the backing for all other Bible truths. Without them there could be no revelations at all. God did not write a book and send it by messenger to be read at a distance by unaided minds. He spoke a book and lives in his spoken words, constantly speaking his words and causing the power of them to persist across the years. God breathed on clay, and it became a man. He breathes on men, and they become clay. Return, ye children of men was the word spoken at the fall by which God decreed the death of every man, and no added word has he needed to speak. The sad procession of mankind across the face of the earth from birth to the grave is proof that his original word was enough. We have not given sufficient attention to the deep utterance in the Gospel of John. That word was the true light which lightens every man that comes into this world. Shift the punctuation around as we will, and the truth is still there. The word of God affects the hearts of all men as light in the soul. In the hearts of all men, the light shines, the word sounds, and there is no escaping them. Something like this would of necessity be so, if God is alive and in his world. And John says that it is so. Even those individuals who have never heard of the Bible have still been preached to with sufficient clarity to remove every excuse from their hearts forever, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, accusing and also excusing their reasonings one with another. For the invisible things of him, his eternal power and divinity, are clearly understood by the creation of the world and by the things that are made, so that there is no excuse. This universal voice of God was by the ancient Hebrews often called wisdom and was said to be everywhere sounding and searching throughout the earth, seeking some response from the sons of men. The eighth chapter of the book of Proverbs begins, Doth not wisdom cry and give her voice to intelligence? The writer then pictures wisdom as a beautiful woman standing in the top of the high places, by the way at the crossroads of the paths. She sounds her voice from every quarter so that no one may miss hearing it. Unto you, O men, I call, and my voice is to the sons of men. Then she pleads for the simple and the foolish to give ear to her words. It is a spiritual response for which this wisdom of God is pleading, a response which she has always sought and is but rarely able to secure. The tragedy is that our eternal welfare depends upon our hearing, and we have trained our ears not to hear. This universal voice has ever sounded and it has often troubled men even when they did not understand the source of their fears. Could it be that this voice, distilling like a living mist upon the hearts of men, has been the undiscovered cause of the troubled conscience and the longing for the immortality confessed by millions since the dawn of recorded history? We need not fear to face up to this. The speaking voice is a fact. How men have reacted to it is for any observer to note. When God spoke out of heaven to our Lord, self-centered men who heard it explained it by natural causes. They said, It thundered. 
This habit of explaining the voice by appeals to natural law is at the very root of modern science. In the living, breathing cosmos, there is a mysterious something, too wonderful, too awful for any mind to understand. The believing man does not claim to understand. He falls to his knees and whispers, God. The man of earth kneels also, but not to worship. He kneels to examine, to search, and to find the cause and the how of things. Just now we happen to be living in a secular age. Our thought habits are those of the scientist, not those of the worshipper. We are more likely to explain than to adore. It thundered, we exclaim, and we go on our earthly way. But still, the voice sounds and searches. The order and life of the world depend upon that voice. But men are usually too busy or too stubborn to give attention. Every one of us has had experiences which we have not been able to explain, a sudden sense of loneliness or a feeling of wonder or awe in the face of the universal vastness. Or we have had a fleeting visitation of light, like an illumination from some other sun, giving us in a quick flash an assurance that we are from another world, that our origins are divine. What we saw there, or felt, or heard, may have been contrary to all that we've been taught in the schools, and at wide variance with all of our former beliefs and opinions. We were forced to suspend our acquired doubts while, for a moment, the clouds were rolled back, and we saw and heard for ourselves. Explain such things as we will. I think we have not been fair to the facts until we allow at least the possibility that such experiences may arise from the presence of God in the world and his persistent effort to communicate with mankind. Let us not dismiss such a hypothesis too flippantly. It is my own belief, and here I shall not feel bad if no one follows me, that every good and beautiful thing which man has produced in the world has been the result of his faulty and sin-blocked response to the creative voice sounding over the earth. The moral philosophers who dreamed their high dreams of virtue, the religious thinkers who speculated about God and immortality, the poets and artists who created out of common stuff pure and lasting beauty. How can we explain them? It was not enough to say simply, it was genius. What then is genius? Could it be that a genius is a man haunted by the speaking voice, laboring and striving like one possessed to achieve ends which he only vaguely understands? That the great man may have missed God in his labors, that he may have even spoken or written against God, does not destroy the idea I am advancing. God's redemptive revelation in the Holy Scriptures is necessary to saving faith, and peace with God. Faith in a risen Savior is necessary if the vague stirrings toward immortality are to bring us to restful and satisfying communion with God. To me, this is a plausible explanation of all that is best out of Christ. But you can be a good Christian and not accept my thesis. The voice of God is a friendly voice. No one need fear to listen to it unless he has already made up his mind to resist it. The blood of Jesus has covered not only the human race, but all creation as well. Having made peace through the blood of his cross, whether they are the things in the earth or the things in the heavens, we may safely preach a friendly heaven. The heavens as well as the earth are filled with the good will of him that dwelt in the bush. The perfect blood of atonement secures this forever. Whoever will listen will hear the speaking heaven. This is definitely not the hour when men take kindly to an exhortation to listen. For listening is not today a part of popular religion. 
we are at the opposite end of the pole from there. Religion has accepted the monstrous heresy that noise, size, activity, and bluster make a man dear to God. But we may take heart. To a people caught in the tempest of the last great conflict, God says, Be still, and know that I am God. And still he says it as if he means to tell us that our strength and safety lie not in noise, but in silence. It is important that we get still to wait on God, and it is best that we get alone, preferably with our Bible outspread before us. Then, if we will, we may draw near to God and begin to hear Him speak to us in our hearts. I think that for the average person the progression will be something like this. First a sound as of a presence walking in the garden. Then a voice, more intelligible but still far from clear. Then the happy moment when the Spirit begins to illuminate the Scriptures and that which had been only a sound, or at best a voice, now becomes an intelligible word, warm and intimate and clear as the word of a dear friend. Then will come life and light, and best of all, the ability to see and rest in and embrace Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord and all. The Bible will never be a living book to us until we are convinced that God is articulate in His universe. To jump from a dead, impersonal world to a dogmatic Bible is too much for most people. They may admit that they should accept the Bible as the Word of God, and they may try to think of it as such. But they may find it impossible to believe that the words there on the page are actually for them. A man may say, these words are addressed to me, and yet in his heart not feel and know that they are. He is the victim of a divided psychology. He tries to think of God as mute everywhere else and vocal only in a book. I believe that much of our religious unbelief is due to a wrong conception of and a wrong feeling for the scriptures of truth. A silent God suddenly began to speak in a book, and when the book was finished, he lapsed back into silence again forever. Now we read the book as the record of what God said when he was, for a brief time, in a speaking mood. With notions like that in our heads, how can we believe? The facts are that God is not silent. He never has been silent. It's the nature of God to speak. The second person of the Holy Trinity is called the Word. The Bible is the inevitable outcome of God's continuous speech. It is the infallible declaration of His mind for us, put into our familiar human words. I think a new world will arise out of the religious mists when we approach our Bible with the idea that it is not only a book which was once spoken, but it is also a book which is now speaking. The prophets habitually said, Thus saith the Lord. They intended their hearers to understand that God's speaking is in the continuous present. We may use the past tense properly to indicate that at a certain time a certain word of God was spoken, but a word of God once spoken continues to be spoken, as a child once born continues to be alive, or a world once created continues to exist. And those are but imperfect illustrations, for children die and worlds burn out. But the word of our God endureth forever. If you would follow on to know the Lord, come at once to the open Bible, expecting it to speak to you. Do not come with the notion that it is a thing which you may push around at your convenience. It is more than a thing. It is a voice, a word, the very word of the living God. Lord, teach me to listen. The times are noisy, and my ears are weary with the thousand raucous sounds which continuously assault them. 
Give me the spirit of the boy Samuel when he said to thee, Speak, for thy servant heareth. Let me hear thee speaking in my heart. Let me get used to the sound of thy voice, that its tones may be familiar when the sounds of earth die away, and the only sound will be the music of thy speaking voice. In Jesus' name, amen. Chapter 7 The Gaze of the Soul With our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, Hebrews 12, verse 2. Let us think of our intelligent, plain man mentioned in chapter 6, coming for the first time to the reading of the Scriptures. He approaches the Bible without any previous knowledge of what it contains. He is wholly without prejudice. He has nothing to prove and nothing to defend. Such a man will not have read long before his mind begins to observe certain truths standing out from the page. They are the spiritual principles behind the record of God's dealings with men and woven into the writings of holy men as they were inspired by the Holy Spirit. As he reads on, he might want to number these truths as they become clear to him and make a brief summary under each number. These summaries will be the tenets of his biblical creed. Further reading will not affect these points except to enlarge and strengthen them. Our man is finding out what the Bible actually teaches. High up on the list of the things which the Bible teaches will be the doctrine of faith. The place of weighty importance which the Bible gives to faith will be too plain for him to miss. He will very likely conclude, Faith is of utmost importance. Without faith it is impossible to please God. Faith will get me anything. Take me anywhere in the kingdom of God. But without faith, there can be no approach to God, no forgiveness, no deliverance, no salvation, no communion, no spiritual life at all. By the time our friend has reached the eleventh chapter of Hebrews, the eloquent expression of high praise which is there pronounced upon faith will not seem strange to him. He will have read Paul's powerful defense of faith, in his Roman and Galatian epistles. Later, if he goes on to study church history, he will understand the amazing power in the teachings of the Reformers as they showed the central place of faith in the Christian religion. Now, if faith is so vitally important, if it is an indispensable must in our pursuit of God, it is perfectly natural that we should be deeply concerned over whether or not we possess this most precious gift and our minds being what they are, it is inevitable that sooner or later we should get around to inquiring after the nature of faith. The question, what is faith, would lie close to the question, do I have faith, and would demand an answer if it were anywhere to be found. Almost all who preach or write on the subject of faith have the same things to say concerning it. They tell us that it is believing a promise that it is taking God at His word, that it is reckoning the Bible to be true and stepping out upon it. The rest of the book or sermon is usually taken up with stories of people who have had their prayers answered as a result of their faith. These answers are mostly direct gifts of a practical and temporal nature, such as health, money, physical protection, or success in business. Or, if the teacher is of a philosophic turn of mind, he may take another course and lose us in a tumult of metaphysics or snow us under with psychological jargon as he defines and redefines, carving the slender hair of faith thinner and thinner until it disappears in gossamer shavings at last. When he's finished, we get up, disappointed, and go out by the same door wherein we went. Surely there must be something better than this. In the Scriptures there is practically no effort made to define faith. Outside of a brief fifteen-word definition in Hebrews 11 verse 1, I know of no biblical definition, and even there faith is defined functionally, not philosophically. That is, 
It is a statement of what faith is in operation and not what it is in essence. It assumes the presence of faith and shows what it results in rather than what it is. We will be wise to go just that far and attempt to go no further. We are told from whence it comes and by what means. Faith is the gift of God, and faith comes by hearing, and the ear to hear by the word of God. This much is clear, and to paraphrase Thomas a Kempis, I had rather exercise faith than know the definition thereof. From here on, when the words faith is, or their equivalent, occur in this chapter, I ask that they be understood to refer to what faith is in operation as exercised by a believing man. Right here we drop the notion of definition and think about faith as it may be experienced in action. The complexion of our thoughts will be practical, not theoretical. In a dramatic story in the book of Numbers, faith is seen in action. Israel became discouraged and spoke against God, and the Lord sent fiery serpents among them, and they bit the people, and many people of Israel died. Then Moses sought the Lord for them, and he heard, and gave a remedy against the bite of the serpents. He commanded Moses to make a serpent of brass, and put it upon a pole in sight of all the people, and it shall be that any one that is bitten and looks upon it shall live. Moses obeyed, and it came to pass that when a serpent bit any one, he beheld the serpent of brass and lived. Numbers 21, verses 4 through 9. In the New Testament, this important bit of history is interpreted for us by no less an authority than our Lord Jesus Christ himself. He is explaining to his hearers how they may be saved. He tells them that it is by believing. Then, to make it clear, he refers to this incident in the book of Numbers. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. John 3, verses 14 through 15. Our plain man, in reading this, would make an important discovery. He would notice that look and believe were synonymous terms. Looking on the Old Testament serpent is identical with believing on the New Testament Christ. That is, the looking and the believing are the same thing. And he would understand that while Israel looked with their external eyes, believing is done with the heart. I think he would conclude that faith is the gaze of a soul upon a saving God. When he had seen this, he would remember passages he had read before, and their meaning would come flooding over him. They looked unto him and were lightened, and their faces were not ashamed. Psalm 34, verse 5 Unto thee lift I up mine eyes, O thou that dwellest in the heavens. Behold, as the eyes of slaves look unto the hand of their masters, and as the eyes of a maiden unto the hand of her mistress, so our eyes wait upon the Lord our God, until he shall have mercy upon us. Psalm 123, verses 1 and 2. Here the man seeking mercy looks straight at the God of mercy, and never takes his eyes away from him until mercy is granted and our Lord himself looked always at God. Looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke and gave the loaves to his disciples. Matthew 14, verse 19. Indeed, Jesus taught that he wrought his works by always keeping his inward eyes upon his Father. His power lay in his continuous look at God. John 5, verses 19 through 21. In full accord with the few texts we've quoted is the whole tenor of the inspired word. It is summed up for us in the Hebrew epistle when we are instructed to run life's race with our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. 
From all of this, we learn that faith is not a once-done act, but a continuous gaze of the heart at the triune God. Believing, then, is directing the heart's attention to Jesus. It is lifting the mind to behold the Lamb of God, and never ceasing that beholding for the rest of our lives. At first, this may be difficult, but it becomes easier as we look steadily at His wondrous person, quietly and without strain. Distractions may hinder, but once the heart is committed to Him, after each brief excursion away from Him, the attention will return again and rest upon Him, like a wandering bird coming back to its window. I would emphasize this one committal, this one great volitional act which establishes the heart's intention to gaze forever upon Jesus. God takes this intention for our choice and makes what allowances he must for the thousand distractions which beset us in this evil world. He knows that we have set the direction of our hearts toward Jesus, and we can know it too and comfort ourselves with the knowledge that a habit of soul is forming, which will become, after a while, a sort of spiritual reflex which requires no more conscious effort on our part. Faith is the least self-regarding of the virtues. It is, by its very nature, scarcely conscious of its own existence. Like the eye which sees everything in front of it and never sees itself, Faith is occupied with the object upon which it rests and pays no attention to itself at all. While we are looking at God, we do not see ourselves. Blessed riddance! The man who has struggled to purify himself and has had nothing but repeated failures will experience real relief when he stops tinkering with his soul and looks away to the perfect one. While he looks at Christ, the very thing he has so long been trying to do will be getting done within him. It will be God working within him to will and to do. Faith is not in itself a meritorious act. The merit is in the one toward whom it is directed. Faith is a redirecting of our sight, a getting out of the focus of our own vision and getting God into focus. Sin has twisted our vision inward and made it self-regarding. Unbelief has put self where God should be and is perilously close to the sin of Lucifer who said, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Faith looks out instead of in, and the whole of life falls into line. All this may seem too simple, but we have no apology to make. Those who would seek to climb into heaven after help or descend into hell, God says, The word is near thee, that is, the word of faith. The word induces us to lift up our eyes unto the Lord, and the blessed work of faith begins. When we lift our inward eyes to gaze upon God, we are sure to meet friendly eyes gazing back at us. For it is written that the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout all the earth. The sweet language of experience is, Thou God seest me. When the eyes of the soul looking out meet the eyes of God looking in, heaven has begun right here on this earth. When all my endeavor is turned toward thee, because all thy endeavor is turned toward me, when I look unto thee alone with all my attention, nor ever turn aside the eyes of my mind, because thou dost enfold me with thy constant regard. When I direct my love toward thee alone, because thou, who art love's self, hast turned thee toward me alone. And what, Lord, is my life, save that embrace wherein thy delightsome sweetness doth so lovingly enfold me? So wrote Nicholas of Cusa four hundred years ago. I should like to say more about this old man of God. 
He is not much known today anywhere among Christian believers, and among current fundamentalists, he is known not at all. But I feel that we could gain much from a little acquaintance with this man. Men of his spiritual favor and the school of Christian thought which they represent. Christian literature, to be accepted and approved by the evangelical leaders of our times, must follow very closely the same train of thought, a kind of party line from which it is scarcely safe to depart. A half century of this in America has made us smug and content. We imitate each other with slavish devotion and our most strenuous efforts are put forth to try to say the same thing that everyone around us is saying. And yet, to find an excuse for saying it, some little safe variation on the approved theme, or, if no more, at least a new illustration. Nicholas was a true follower of Christ, a lover of the Lord, radiant and shining in his devotion to the person of Jesus. His theology was orthodox, but fragrant, and sweet as everything about Jesus might properly be expected to be. His conception of eternal life, for instance, is beautiful in itself, and if I mistake it not, it is nearer in spirit to John 17.3 than that which is current among us today. Life eternal, says Nicholas, is not other than that blessed regard wherewith thou never ceasest to behold me, yea, even the secret places of my soul. With thee to behold is to give life, tis unceasingly to impart sweetest love of thee, tis to inflame me to love of thee by love's imparting, and to feed me by inflaming, and by feeding to kindle my yearning, and by kindling to make me drink of the dew of gladness, and by drinking to infuse in me a fountain of life, and by infusing to make it increase and endure. Now, if faith is the gaze of the heart at God, and if this gaze is but the rising of the inward eyes to meet the all-seeing eyes of God, then it follows that it is one of the easiest things possible to do. It would be like God to make the most vital thing easy and place it within the range of possibility for the weakest and poorest of us. Several conclusions may fairly be drawn from all of this. The simplicity of it, for instance, is one. Since believing is looking, it can be done without special equipment or religious paraphernalia. God has seen to it that the one life and death essential can never be subject to the caprice of accident. Equipment can break down or get lost. Water can leak away. Records can be destroyed by fire. The minister can be delayed or the church can burn down. All these are external to the soul and are subject to accident or mechanical failure but looking is of the heart and can be done successfully by any man standing up or kneeling down or lying in his last agony a thousand miles from any church. Since believing is looking, it can be done any time. No season is superior to any other season for this sweetest of all acts. God never made salvation dependent upon new moons or holy days, or Sabbaths. A man is not nearer to Christ on Easter Sunday than he is, say, on Saturday, August 3rd, or Monday, October 4th. As long as Christ sits on the mediatorial throne, every day is a good day, and all days are days of salvation. Neither does place matter in this blessed work of believing God. Lift your heart and let it rest upon Jesus, and you are instantly in a sanctuary. Though it be a bed, or a factory, or a kitchen, you can see God from anywhere, if your mind is set to love and obey Him. Now someone may ask, Is not this of which you speak for special people, such as monks, or ministers, 
who have by the nature of their calling more time to devote to quiet meditation. I am a busy worker and have little time to spend alone. I am happy to say that the life I describe is for every one of God's children, regardless of calling. It is, in fact, happily practiced every day by many hard-working people and is beyond the reach of none. Many have found the secret of which I speak, and without giving much thought to what is going on within them, constantly practice this habit of inwardly gazing upon God. They know that something inside their hearts sees God, even when they are compelled to withdraw their conscious attention in order to engage in earthly affairs, there is something within them, a secret communion always going on. Let their attention be released for a moment from necessary business, and it flies at once to God again. This has been the testimony of many Christians, so many that even as I state it thus, I have a feeling that I am quoting though from whom or from how many I cannot possibly know. I do not want to leave the impression that the ordinary means of grace have no value. They most assuredly have. Private prayer should be practiced by every Christian. Long periods of Bible meditation will purify our gaze and direct it. Church attendance will enlarge our outlook and increase our love for others. Service and work and activity, all are good and should be engaged in by every Christian, but the foundation of all these things, giving meaning to them, will be the inward habit of beholding God. A new set of eyes, so to speak, will develop within us, enabling us to be looking at God while our outward eyes are seeing the scenes of this passing world. Someone may fear that we are magnifying private religion out of all proportion, that the us of the New Testament is being replaced by a selfish I. Has it ever occurred to you that one hundred pianos all tuned to the same fork are automatically tuned to each other? They are of one accord by being tuned not to each other, but to another standard to which each one must individually bow. So one hundred worshippers meeting together, each one looking away to Christ, are in heart nearer to each other than they could possibly be when they were to become unity conscious and turn their eyes away from God to strive for closer fellowship. Social religion is perfected when private religion is purified. The body becomes stronger as its members become healthier. The whole church of God gains when the members that compose it begin to seek a better and a higher life. All of the foregoing presupposes true repentance and a full commitment of the life to God. It is hardly necessary to mention this, for only individuals who have made such a commitment will have read this far. When the habit of inwardly gazing Godward becomes fixed within us, we shall be ushered on to a new level of spiritual life more in keeping with the promises of God and the mood of the New Testament. The triune God will be our dwelling place, even while our feet walk the low road of simple duty here among men. We will have found life's summum bonum, the highest good, indeed. There is the source of all delights that can be desired. Not only can not better be thought out by men and angels, but not better can exist in mode of being. For it is the absolute maximum of every rational desire than which a greater cannot be. O oh Lord, I have heard a good word, inviting me to look away to Thee and be satisfied. My heart longs to respond, but Sin has clouded my vision until I see thee but dimly. Be pleased to cleanse me in thine own precious blood and make me inwardly pure so that I may with unveiled eyes gaze upon thee all the days of my earthly pilgrimage. Then shall I be prepared to behold thee in full splendor 
in the day when thou shalt appear to be glorified in thy saints, and admired in all them that believe. In Jesus' name, amen. The Vision of God, Chapter 8 Restoring the Creator-Creature Relation Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be above all the earth. Psalm 57, verse 5 It is a truism to say that order in nature depends upon right relationships. To achieve harmony, each thing must be in its proper position relative to each other thing. In human life it is not otherwise. I have hinted before in these chapters that the cause of all our human miseries is a radical moral dislocation, an upset in our relationship to God and to each other. For whatever else the fall may have been, it was most certainly a sharp change in man's relationship to his Creator. He adopted toward God an altered attitude, and by so doing destroyed the proper Creator-Creature relationship in which, unknown to him, his true happiness lay. Essentially, salvation is the restoration of a right relationship between man and his creator, a bringing back to normal the creator-creature relationship. A satisfactory spiritual life will begin with a complete change in relationship between God and the sinner. Not a judicial change merely but a conscious and experienced change affecting the sinner's whole nature. The atonement in Jesus' blood makes such a change judicially possible, and the working of the Holy Spirit makes it emotionally satisfying. The story of the prodigal son perfectly illustrates this latter phase. He had brought a world of trouble upon himself by forsaking the position which he had properly held as son of his father. In reality, his restoration was nothing more than a re-establishing of the father-son relationship which had existed from his birth and had been altered temporarily by his act of sinful rebellion. This story overlooks the legal aspect of redemption, but it makes beautifully clear the experiential aspects of salvation. In determining relationships, we must begin somewhere. There must be somewhere a fixed center against which everything else is measured, where the law of relativity does not enter, and we can say, is, and make no allowances. Such a center is God. When God would make his name known to mankind, he could find no better words than, I am. When he speaks in the first person, he says, I am. When we speak of him, we say, He is. When we speak to him, we say, Thou art. Everyone and everything else measures from that fixed point. I am that I am, says God. I, the Lord, do not change. As the sailor locates his position on the sea by shooting the sun, so may we get our moral bearings by looking at God. We must begin with God. We are right when and only when we stand in a right position relative to God, and we are wrong so far and so long as we stand in any other position. Much of our difficulty as seeking Christians stems from our unwillingness to take God as He is and adjust our own lives accordingly. We insist upon trying to modify Him and bring him nearer to our own image. The flesh whimpers against the rigor of God's inexorable sentence and begs like Agag for a little mercy, a little indulgence of its carnal ways. It is no use. We can get a right start only by accepting God as he is and learning to love him for what he is. As we go on to know him better, we shall find it a source of unspeakable joy that God is just what he is. Some of the most rapturous moments we know will be those we spend in reverent admiration of the Godhead. In those holy moments, the very thought of change in him will be too painful to endure. So let us begin with God. 
Behind all, above all, before all, is God. He is first in sequential order, above in rank and station, exalted in dignity and honor. As the self-existent one, He gave being to all things, and all things exist out of Him and for Him. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and virtue, for Thou hast created all things, and by Thy will they have their being and were created. Every man, woman, and child belongs to God and exists by His pleasure. God, being who and what He is, and we being who and what we are, the only thinkable relationship between us is one of full lordship on His part and complete submission on ours. We owe Him every honor that is in our power to give Him. Our everlasting grief lies in giving Him anything less. The pursuit of God will embrace the labor of bringing our total personality into conformity to His, and this not judicially, but actually. I do not here refer to the act of justification by faith in Christ. I speak of a voluntary exalting of God to His proper station over us and a willing surrender of our whole being to the place of worshipful submission which the Creator-Creature circumstance makes proper. The moment we make up our minds that we are going on with this determination to exalt God over all, we step out of the world's parade. We shall find ourselves out of adjustment to the ways of the world, and increasingly so as we make progress in the holy way. We shall acquire a new viewpoint, a new and different psychology will be formed within us, a new power will begin to surprise us by its upsurgings and its outgoings. Our break with the world will be the direct outcome of our changed relationship to God. For the world of fallen men does not honor God. Millions call themselves by His name. It is true. And some pay token respect to Him. But a simple test will show how little He is really honored among them. Let the average man be put to the proof on the question of who is above, and his true position will be exposed. Let him be forced into making a choice between God and money, between God and men, between God and personal ambition, God in self, God in human love. And God will take second place every time. Those other things will be exalted above. However the man may protest, the proof is in the choices he makes day after day throughout his life. Be thou exalted is the language of victorious spiritual experience. It is a little key to unlock the door to great treasures of grace. It is central in the life of a godly man. Let the seeking man reach a place where life and lips join to say continually, be thou exalted, and a thousand minor problems will be solved at once. His Christian life ceases to be the complicated thing it had been before and becomes the very essence of simplicity. By the exercise of his will he has set his course, and on that course he will stay as if guided by an automatic pilot. If blown off course for a moment by some adverse wind, he will surely return again as by a secret bent of the soul. The hidden motions of the Spirit are working in his favor, and the stars in their courses fight for him. He has met his life problem at its center, and everything else must follow along. Let no one imagine that he will lose anything of human dignity by this voluntary sellout of his all to his God. He does not by this degrade himself as a man. Rather, he finds his right place of high honor as one made in the image of his Creator. His deep disgrace lay in his moral derangement, his unnatural usurpation of the place of God. 
his honor will be proved by restoring again that stolen throne. In exalting God over all, he finds his own highest honor upheld. Anyone who might feel reluctant to surrender his will to the will of another should remember Jesus' words, Whosoever commits sin is the slave of sin. We must of necessity be a servant to someone, either to God or to sin. The sinner prides himself on his independence, completely overlooking the fact that he is the weak slave of the sins that rule his members. The man who surrenders to Christ exchanges a cruel slave driver for a kind and gentle master whose yoke is easy and whose burden is light. Made as we were in the image of God, we scarcely find it strange to take again our God as our all. God was our original habitat, and our hearts cannot but feel at home when they enter again that ancient and beautiful abode. I hope it is clear that there is logic behind God's claim to preeminence. That place is His by every right in earth or heaven. When we take to ourselves the place that is His, the whole course of our lives gets out of joint. Nothing will or can restore order until our hearts make the great decision. God shall be exalted above. Those that honor me, I will honor, said God once to a priest of Israel, and that ancient law of the kingdom stands today unchanged by the passing of time or the changes of dispensation. The whole Bible and every page of history proclaim the perpetuation of that law. The one that serves me will my father honor proclaimed the Lord Jesus, tying in the old with the new and revealing the essential unity of His ways with men. Sometimes the best way to see a thing is to look at its opposite. Eli and his sons are placed in the priesthood with the stipulation that they honor God in their lives and ministrations. This they fail to do and God sends Samuel to announce the consequences. Unknown to Eli, this law of reciprocal honor has been all the while secretly working, and now the time has come for judgment to fall. Hophni and Phinehas, the degenerate priests, fall in battle. The wife of Phinehas dies in childbirth. Israel flees before her enemies. The ark of God is captured by the Philistines, and the old man Eli falls backward and dies of a broken neck. Thus, stark and utter tragedy followed upon Eli's failure to honor God. Now, set over against this almost any biblical character who honestly tried to glorify God in his earthly walk. See how God winked at weaknesses and overlooked failures as he poured upon his servants grace and blessing untold. Let it be Abraham, Jacob, David, Daniel, Elijah, or whom you will. Honor followed honor as harvest follows the seed. The man of God set his heart to exalt God above all. God accepted his intention as fact and acted accordingly. Not perfection, but holy intention made the difference. In our Lord Jesus Christ, this law was seen in simple perfection. In his lowly manhood, he humbled himself and gladly gave all glory to his Father in heaven. He sought not his own honor, but the honor of God who sent him. If I glorify myself, he said on one occasion, my glory is nothing. It is my Father that glorifies me. So far had the proud Pharisees departed from this law that they could not understand one who honored God at his own expense. I honor my Father, said Jesus to them, and ye do dishonor me. Another saying of Jesus, and a most disturbing one, was put in the form of a question. 
How can ye believe, who take glory one from another, and seek not the glory that comes only from God? If I understand this correctly, Christ taught here the alarming doctrine that the desire for honor among men made belief impossible. Is this sin at the root of religious unbelief? Could it be that those intellectual difficulties which men blame for their inability to believe are but smoke screens to conceal the real cause that lies behind them? Was it this greedy desire for honor from man that made men into Pharisees and Pharisees into those who killed God? Is this the secret behind religious self-righteousness and empty worship? I believe it may be. The whole course of the life is upset by failure to put God where He belongs. We exalt ourselves instead of God, and the curse follows. In our desire after God, let us always keep in mind that God also has desire, and His desire is toward the sons of men and more particularly toward those sons of men who will make the once-for-all decision to exalt him over all. Such as these are precious to God above all treasures of earth or sea. In them God finds a theater where he can display his exceeding kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. With them God can walk unhindered, and toward them he can act like the God he is. In speaking thus, I have one fear. It is that I may convince the mind before God can win the heart. For this God above all position is not one easy to take. The mind may approve it while not having the consent of the will to put it into effect. While the imagination races ahead to honor God, the will may lag behind and the man may never guess how divided his heart is. The whole man must make the decision before the heart can know any real satisfaction. God wants us all, and he will not rest until he gets us all. No part of the man will do. Let us pray over this in detail, throwing ourselves at God's feet and meaning everything we say. No one who prays thus in sincerity need wait long for tokens of divine acceptance. God will unveil His glory before His servant's eyes, and He will place all His treasures at the disposal of such a one, for He knows that His honor is safe in such consecrated hands. O God, be Thou exalted over my possessions, Nothing of earth's treasures shall seem dear unto me, if only thou art glorified in my life. Be thou exalted over my friendships. I am determined that thou shalt be above all, though I must stand deserted and alone in the midst of the earth. Be thou exalted above my comforts, though it mean the loss of bodily comforts and the carrying of heavy crosses. I shall keep my vow made this day before thee. Be thou exalted over my reputation. Make me ambitious to please thee, even if as a result I must sink into obscurity and my name be forgotten as a dream. Rise, O Lord, into thy proper place of honor, above my ambitions, above my likes and dislikes above my family, my health, and even my life itself. Let me decrease, that thou mayest increase. Let me sink, that thou mayest rise above. Ride forth upon me, as thou didst ride into Jerusalem, mounted upon the humble little beast, a colt, the foal of an ass. And let me hear the children cry to thee, Hosanna in the highest. In Jesus' name, amen. Chapter 9 Meekness and Rest Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. 
Matthew 5, verse 5. A fairly accurate description of the human race might be furnished to one unacquainted with it by taking the Beatitudes, turning them wrong side out, and saying, Here is your human race. For the exact opposite of the virtues and the Beatitudes are the very qualities which distinguish human life and conduct. In the world of men we find nothing approaching the virtues of which Jesus spoke in the opening words of the famous Sermon on the Mount. Instead of poverty of spirit, we find the rankest kind of pride. Instead of mourners, we find pleasure seekers. Instead of meekness, we find arrogance. Instead of hungering after righteousness, we hear men saying, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. Instead of mercy, we find cruelty. Instead of purity of heart, we find corrupt imaginings. Instead of peacemakers, we find men quarrelsome and resentful. Instead of rejoicing in mistreatment, we find them fighting back with every weapon at their command. Of this kind of moral stuff, civilized society is composed. The atmosphere is charged with it. We breathe it with every breath and drink it with our mother's milk. Culture and education refine these things slightly, but leave them basically untouched. A whole world of literature has been created to justify this kind of life as the only normal one. And this is the more to be wondered at, seeing that these are the evils which make life the bitter struggle it is for all of us. All our heartaches, and a great many of our physical ills, spring directly out of our sins. Pride, arrogance, resentfulness, evil imaginings, malice and greed are the sources of more human pain than all the diseases that ever afflicted mortal flesh. Into a world like this, the sound of Jesus' words comes wonderful and strange, a visitation from above. It is well that he spoke, for no one else could have done it as well and it is good that we listen. His words are the essence of truth. He is not offering an opinion. Jesus never uttered opinions. He never guessed. He knew, and he knows. His words are not as Solomon's were, the sum of sound wisdom or the results of keen observation. He spoke out of the fullness of his Godhead, and his words are very truth itself. He is the only one who could say, Blessed, with complete authority. For he is the Blessed One, come from the world above to confer blessedness upon mankind. And his words were supported by deeds mightier than any performed on this earth by any other man. It is wisdom for us to listen. As was often so with Jesus, he used this word, meek, in a brief crisp sentence, and not until some time later did he go on to explain it. In the same book of Matthew he tells us more about it and applies it to our lives. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and humble of heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Here we have two things standing in contrast to each other, a burden and a rest. The burden is not a local one, peculiar to those first hearers, but one which is borne by the whole human race. It consists not of political oppression or poverty or hard work. It is far deeper than that. It is felt by the rich as well as the poor, for it is something from which wealth and idleness can never deliver us. The burden borne by mankind is a heavy and crushing thing. The word Jesus used means a load carried or toil borne to the point of exhaustion. Rest is simply release from that burden. It is not something we do, it is what comes to us when we cease to do. His own meekness, that is the rest. 
Let us examine our burden. It is altogether an interior one. It attacks the heart and the mind and reaches the body only from within. First, there is the burden of pride. The labor of self-love is a heavy one indeed. Think for yourself whether much of your sorrow has not arisen from someone speaking slightingly of you. As long as you set yourself up as a little god to which you must be loyal, there will be those who will delight to offer an affront to your idol. How then can you hope to have inward peace? The heart's fierce effort to protect itself from every slight, to shield its touchy honor from the bad opinion of friend and enemy, will never let the mind have rest. Continue this fight through the years, and the burden will become intolerable. Yet the sons of earth are carrying this burden continually, challenging every word spoken against them, cringing under every criticism, smarting under each fancied slight, tossing sleepless if another is preferred before them. Such a burden as this is not necessary to bear. Jesus calls us to his rest, and meekness is his method. The meek man cares not at all who is greater than he, for he has long ago decided that the esteem of the world is not worth the effort. He develops toward himself a kindly sense of humor and learns to say, Oh, so you have been overlooked. They have placed someone else before you. They have whispered that you are pretty small stuff after all. And now you feel hurt because the world is saying about you the very things you have been saying about yourself. Only yesterday you were telling God that you were nothing, a mere worm of the dust. Where's your consistency? Come on, humble yourself, and cease to care what men think. The meek man is not a human mouse afflicted with a sense of his own inferiority. Rather, he may be in his moral life as bold as a lion, and as strong as Samson. But he has stopped being fooled about himself. He has accepted God's estimate of his own life. He knows he is as weak and helpless as God has declared him to be. But paradoxically, he knows at the same time that he is in the sight of God of more importance than angels. In himself, nothing. But in God, everything. That is his motto. He knows well that the world will never see him as God sees him, and he has stopped caring. He rests perfectly content to allow God to set his own values. He will be patient to wait for the day when everything will get its own price tag, and real worth will come into its own. Then the righteous shall shine forth in the kingdom of their father. He's willing to wait for that day. In the meantime, he will have attained a peace of soul rest. As he walks on in meekness, he will be happy to let God defend him. The old struggle to defend himself is over. He has found the peace which meekness brings. Then also he will get deliverance from the burden of pretense. By this I mean not hypocrisy but the common human desire to put the best foot forward and hide from the world our real inward poverty. For sin has played many evil tricks upon us, and one has been the infusing into us a false sense of shame. There is hardly a man or woman who dares to be just what he or she is without doctoring up the impression, the fear of being found out gnaws like rodents within their hearts. The man of culture is haunted by the fear that some day he will come upon a man more cultured than himself. The learned man fears to meet a man more learned than he. The rich man sweats under the fear that his clothes or his car or his house will sometime be made to look cheap by comparison with those of another rich man. So-called society runs by a motivation not higher than this. 
and the poorer classes on their level are little better. Let no one smile this off. These burdens are real, and little by little they kill the victims of this evil and unnatural way of life. And the psychology created by years of this kind of thing makes true meekness seem as unreal as a dream, as aloof as a star. To all the victims of the gnawing disease, Jesus says, Become as little children. For little children do not compare. They receive direct enjoyment from what they have without relating it to something else or someone else. Only as they get older and sin begins to stir within their hearts do jealousy and envy appear. Then they are unable to enjoy what they have if someone else has something bigger or better. At that early age does the galling burden come down upon their tender souls, and it never leaves them until Jesus sets them free. Another source of burden is artificiality. I am sure that most people live in secret fear that they will someday be careless, and by chance an enemy or friend will be allowed to peep into their poor, empty souls. So they are never relaxed. Bright people are tense and alert in fear that they may be trapped into saying something common or stupid. Traveled people are afraid that they may meet some Marco Polo who is able to describe some remote place where they have never been. This unnatural condition is part of our sad heritage of sin but in our day it is aggravated by our whole way of life. Advertising is largely based upon this habit of pretense. Courses are offered in this or that field of human learning, frankly appealing to the victim's desire to shine at a party. Books are sold, clothes and cosmetics are peddled, by playing continually upon this desire to appear what we are not. Artificiality is one curse that will drop away the moment we kneel at Jesus' feet and surrender ourselves to his meekness. Then we will not care what people think of us, so long as God is pleased. Then what we are will be everything. What we appear will take its place far down the scale of interest for us. Apart from sin, we have nothing of which to be ashamed. Only an evil desire to shine in our own right makes us want to appear other than we are. The heart of the world is breaking under this load of pride and pretense. There is no release from our burden apart from the meekness of Christ. Good, keen reasoning may help slightly, but so strong is this vice that if we push it down one place it will come up somewhere else. To men and women everywhere Jesus says, Come unto me, and I will give you rest. The rest he offers is the rest of meekness, the blessed relief which comes when we accept ourselves for what we are and cease to pretend. It will take some courage at first, but the needed grace will come as we learn that we are sharing this new and easy yoke with the strong Son of God Himself. He calls it my yoke, and He walks at one end while we walk at the other. Lord, make me childlike. Deliver me from the urge to compete with another for place or prestige or position. I would be simple and artless as a little child. Deliver me from pose and pretense. Forgive me for thinking of myself. Help me to forget myself and find my true peace in beholding Thee. That Thou mayest answer this prayer, I humble myself before Thee. Lay upon me Thy easy yoke of self-forgetfulness, that through it I may find rest. In Jesus' name. Amen. Chapter 10 The Sacrament of Living
whether therefore you eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do everything for the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31 One of the greatest hindrances to internal peace which the Christian encounters is the common habit of dividing our lives into two areas, the sacred and the secular. As these areas are conceived to exist apart from each other and to be morally and spiritually incompatible, and as we are compelled by the necessities of living to be always crossing back and forth from the one to the other, our inner lives tend to break up so that we live a divided rather than a unified life. Our trouble springs from the fact that we who follow Christ inhabit at once two worlds, the spiritual and the natural. As children of Adam, we live our lives on earth subject to the limitations of the flesh and the weaknesses and ills to which human nature is heir. Merely to live among men requires of us years of hard toil and much care and attention to the things of this world. In sharp contrast to this is our life in the Spirit. There we enjoy another and higher kind of life. We are children of God. We possess heavenly status and enjoy intimate fellowship with Christ. This tends to divide our total life into two departments. We come unconsciously to recognize two sets of actions. The first are performed with a feeling of satisfaction and a firm assurance that they are pleasing to God. These are the sacred acts, and they are usually thought to be prayer, Bible reading, hymn singing, church attendance, and such other acts as spring directly from faith. They may be known by the fact that they have no direct relation to this world and would have no meaning whatsoever except as faith shows us another world, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Over against these sacred acts are the secular ones. They include all of the ordinary activities of life which we share with the sons and daughters of Adam. Eating, sleeping, working, looking after the needs of the body, and performing our dull and tedious duties here on earth. These we often do reluctantly and with many misgivings, often apologizing to God for what we consider a waste of time and strength. The upshot of this is that we are uneasy most of the time. We go about our common tasks with a feeling of deep frustration, telling ourselves pensively that there is a better day coming when we shall shed this earthly shell and be bothered no more with the affairs of this world. This is the old sacred secular antithesis. Most Christians are caught in its trap. They cannot get a satisfactory adjustment between the claims of the two worlds. They try to walk the tightrope between two kingdoms, and they find no peace in either. Their strength is reduced, their outlook confused, and their joy taken from them. I believe this state of affairs to be wholly unnecessary. We have gotten ourselves on the horns of a dilemma, true enough, but the dilemma is not real. It's a creature of misunderstanding. The sacred, secular antithesis has no foundation in the New Testament. Without doubt, a more perfect understanding of Christian truth will deliver us from it. The Lord Jesus Christ himself is our perfect example, and he knew no divided life. In the presence of his Father he lived on earth without strain, from babyhood to his death on the cross. God accepted the offering of his total life and made no distinction between act and act. I always do those things that please him, was his brief summary of his own life as it related to the Father. As he moved among men, he was poised and restful. What pressure and suffering he endured grew out of his possession as the world's sin-bearer. They were never the result of moral uncertainty or spiritual maladjustment. 
Paul's exhortation to do everything for the glory of God is more than pious idealism. It is an integral part of the sacred revelation and is to be accepted as the very word of truth. It opens before us the possibility of making every act of our lives contribute to the glory of God. Lest we should be too timid to include everything, Paul mentions specifically eating and drinking. This humble privilege we share with the beasts that perish. If these lowly animal acts can be so performed as to honor God, then it becomes difficult to conceive of one that cannot. That monkish hatred of the body, which figures so prominently in the works of certain early devotional writers, is wholly without support in the Spirit of God. Common modesty is found in the sacred scriptures, it is true, but never prudery or a false sense of shame. The New Testament accepts as a matter of course that in His incarnation our Lord took upon Himself a real human body, and no effort is made to steer around the downright implications of such a fact. He lived in that body here among men and never once performed a non-sacred act. His presence in human flesh sweeps away forever the evil notion that there is about the human body something innately offensive to the deity. God created our bodies, and we do not offend Him by placing the responsibility where it belongs. He is not ashamed of the work of His own hands. Perversion misuse and abuse of our human powers should give us cause enough to be ashamed. Bodily acts done in sin and contrary to nature can never honor God. Wherever the human will introduces moral evil, we have no longer our innocent and harmless powers as God made them. We have, instead, an abused and twisted thing which can never bring glory to its Creator. Let us, however, assume that perversions and abuse are not present. Let us think of a Christian believer in whose life the twin wonders of repentance and the new birth have been wrought. He is now living according to the will of God, as he understands it from the written word. Of such a one it may be said that every act of his life is, or can be, as truly sacred as prayer or baptism or the Lord's Supper. To say this is not to bring all acts down to one dead level. It is, rather, to lift every act up into a living kingdom and turn the whole of life into a sacrament. If a sacrament is an external expression of inward grace, then we need not hesitate to accept the above thesis. By one act of consecration of our total selves to God, we can make every subsequent act express that consecration. We need no more be ashamed of our body, the fleshly servant that carries us through life, than Jesus was of the humble beast upon which he rode into Jerusalem. The Lord has need of him, may well apply to our mortal bodies. If Christ dwells in us, we may carry about the Lord of glory, as the little beast did of old, and give occasion to the multitudes to cry, Hosanna in the highest. That we see this truth is not enough. If we would escape from the toils of the sacred, secular dilemma, the truth must run in our blood and condition the complexion of our thoughts. We must practice living to the glory of God actually and determinedly. By meditating upon this truth, by talking it over with God often in our prayers, by recalling it to our minds frequently as we move about among men, a sense of its wondrous meaning will begin to take hold of us. The old, painful duality will go down before a restful unity of life. The knowledge that we are all gods, that He has received all and rejected nothing, will unify our inner lives and make everything sacred to us.
This is not quite all. Long-held habits do not die easily. It will take intelligent thought and a great deal of reverent prayer to escape completely from the sacred secular psychology. For instance, it may be difficult for the average Christian to get hold of the idea that his daily labors can be performed as acts of worship acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. The old antithesis will crop up in the back of his head sometimes to disturb his peace of mind. Nor will that old serpent, the devil, take all this lying down. He will be there in the cab or at the desk or in the field to remind the Christian that he is giving the better part of his day to the things of this world and allotting to his religious duties only a trifling portion of his time. And unless great care is taken, this will create confusion and bring discouragement and heaviness of heart. We can meet this successfully only by the exercise of an aggressive faith. We must offer all our acts to God and believe that He accepts them. Then hold firmly to that position and keep insisting that every act of every hour of the day and night be included in the transaction. Keep reminding God in our times of private prayer that we mean every act for His glory. Then supplement those times by a thousand thought prayers as we go about the job of living. Let us practice the fine art of making every work a priestly ministration. Let us believe that God is in all our simple deeds and learn to find Him there. Accompanying the error which we have been discussing is the sacred secular antithesis as applied to places. It is little short of astonishing that we can read the New Testament and still believe in the inherent sacredness of places as distinguished from other places. This error is so widespread that one feels all alone when he tries to combat it. It has acted as a kind of dye to color the thinking of religious people and has colored the eyes as well, so that it is all but impossible to detect its fallacy. In the face of every New Testament teaching, to the contrary, it has been said and sung throughout the centuries and accepted as part of the Christian message that which it most surely is not. Only the Quakers, so far as my knowledge goes, have had the perception to see the error and the courage to expose it. Here are the facts as I see them. For four hundred years Israel had dwelt in Egypt, surrounded by the crassest idolatry. By the hand of Moses they were brought out at last and started toward the land of promise. The very idea of holiness had been lost to them. To correct this, God began at the bottom. He localized himself in the cloud and fire, and later, when the tabernacle had been built, he dwelt in fiery manifestation in the Holy of Holies. By innumerable distinction, God taught Israel the difference between holy and unholy. There were holy days, holy vessels, holy garments. There were washings, sacrifices, offerings of many kinds. By these means, Israel learned that God is holy. It was this that he was teaching them, not the holiness of things or places, but the holiness of Jehovah was the lesson they must learn. Then came the great day when Christ appeared. Immediately he began to say, You have heard that it was said to the ancients, but I say unto you, the Old Testament schooling was over. When Christ died on the cross, the veil of the temple was rent from top to bottom. The Holy of Holies was opened to everyone who would enter in faith. Christ's words were remembered. The hour cometh when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem shall ye worship the Father. But the hour comes and now is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such to worship Him. 
God is a spirit, and those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Shortly after, Paul took up the cry of liberty and declared all meats clean, every day holy, all places sacred, and every act acceptable to God. The sacredness of times and places, a half-light necessary to the education of the race, passed away before the full sun of spiritual worship. The essential spirituality of worship remained the possession of the church until it was slowly lost with the passing of the years. Then the natural legality of the fallen hearts of men began to introduce the old distinctions. The church came to observe again days and seasons and times. Certain places were chosen and marked out as holy in a special sense. Differences were observed between one and another day or place or person. The sacraments were first two, then three, then four, until with the triumph of Romanism they were fixed at seven. In all charity, and with no desire to reflect unkindly upon any Christian, however misled, I would point out that the Roman Catholic Church represents today the sacred secular heresy carried to its logical conclusion. Its deadliest effect is the complete division it introduces between religion and life. Its teachers attempt to avoid this snare by many footnotes and multitudinous explanations, but the mind's instinct for logic is too strong. In practical living, the division is a fact. From this bondage, Reformers and Puritans and mystics have labored to free us. Today, the trend in conservative circles is back toward that bondage again. It is said that a horse, after it has been led out of a burning building, will sometimes, by a strange obstinacy, break loose from its rescuer and dash back into the building again to perish in the flame. By some such stubborn tendency toward error, fundamentalism in our day is moving back toward spiritual slavery. The observation of days and times is becoming more and more prominent among us. Lent and the Holy Week and Good Friday are words heard more and more frequently upon the lips of gospel Christians. We do not know when we are well off. In order that I may be understood and not misunderstood, I would throw into relief the practical implications of the teachings for which I have been arguing, namely the sacramental quality of everyday living. Over against its positive meanings, I should like to point out a few things it does not mean. It does not mean, for instance, that everything we do is of equal importance with everything else we do or may not do. One act of a good man's life may differ widely from another in importance. Paul's sowing of tents was not equal to his writing of an epistle to the Romans, but both were accepted of God, and both were true acts of worship. Certainly it is more important to lead a soul to Christ than to plant a garden, but the planting of the garden can be as holy an act as the winning of a soul. Again, it does not mean that every man is as useful as every other man. Gifts differ in the body of Christ. A Billy Bray is not to be compared with a Martin Luther or a John Wesley for sheer usefulness to the church and to the world. But the service of the less gifted brother is as pure as that of the more gifted, and God accepts both with equal pleasure. The layman need never think of his humbler task as being inferior to that of his minister. Let every man abide in the calling wherein he is called, and his work will be as sacred as the work of the ministry. It is not what a man does that determines whether his work is sacred or secular. It is why he does it. The motive is everything. Let a man sanctify the Lord God in his heart and he can thereafter do no common act. All he does is good and acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. 
For such a man, living itself will be sacramental, and the whole world a sanctuary. His entire life will be a priestly ministration. As he performs his never-so-simple task, he will hear the voice of the seraphim saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Lord, I would trust thee completely. I would be altogether thine. I would exalt thee above all. I desire that I may feel no sense of possessing anything outside of thee. I want constantly to be aware of thy overshadowing presence and to hear thy speaking voice. I long to live in restful sincerity of heart. I want to live so fully in the Spirit that all my thoughts may be as sweet incense ascending to thee and every act of my life may be an act of worship. Therefore, I pray in the words of thy great servant of old, I beseech thee so for to cleanse the intent of mine heart with the unspeakable gift of thy grace, that I may perfectly love thee and worthily praise thee. And all this I confidently believe thou wilt grant me through the merits of Jesus Christ thy Son. In Jesus' name, Amen. About the Author Hailing from a tiny farming community in western La Joes, Pennsylvania, A. W. Tozer's conversion was as a teenager in Akron, Ohio. While on his way home from work at a tire company, he overheard a street preacher say, If you don't know how to be saved, just call on God, saying, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Upon returning home, he climbed into the attic and heeded the preacher's advice. His first editorial, dated June 3, 1950, he wrote, It will cost something to walk slow in the parade of the ages, while excited men of time rush about, confusing motion with progress. But it will pay in the long run, and the true Christian is not much interested in anything short of that. Among the more than forty books that he authored, at least two are regarded as Christian classics, The Pursuit of God and The Knowledge of the Holy. His books impress on the reader the possibility and necessity for a deeper relationship with God. 